Well, the MonsterVerse roars on from Hollywood, Japan went ahead and released one of the best Godzilla movies of all time. It's a standalone film set just after the events of World War II. So join us as we discuss Godzilla Minus One. Welcome everyone to the Atomic Cinema Experiment. I am Peter and joining me as always is David. I come in peace. This is a science fiction movie podcast. We get together and we talk about a movie. It's quite that simple. And we were able, uh, even though fate told us no repeatedly, that we could do Godzilla Minus One while it was still in theatres. Uh, we mm -hmm. didn't think we could because we, the UK release date was weeks after the US one. It was supposed to be gone from theatres, but it's been doing so well that they extended the theatrical run so David could go see it around the same time as me. And here we are uh, to talk about Godzilla Minus One. We'll start spoiler free, of course, as we always do. I'll just, before we get into it though, I will just say if you're enjoying the show, do hit the like button. It helps us out a bunch more people will find us. And of course, you can support us over at patreon.com slash TV and get some bonus shows and other things. I'll tell you more about that at the end. But uh, let's get into things. So, what's, what's, what's so funny, David? I just, I, I don't know. I just, I, I always get a kick out of whenever you go through the whole thing, the whole intro, all in just one breath. It's called professionalism. Yeah, and that's why I'm here to balance it out with <laughs> clearly being unprofessional. <laughs> Look, if I ever make a mistake, you can tell mm. me, but I don't know what that feels like because I've never made one. So never made a mistake. True. Never. Not in the not in the no. nearly hundred episodes I filmed with you, have you ever made a single mistake? No, I don't recall any. <laughs> I don't, don't think so. If, if if I were the editor on this show right now, it would be where the supercut would show up <laughs> of all the times. <laughs> So yes, Godzilla made a spawn. We'll start spoiler free, of course, as we always do. It is worth mentioning, we actually already recorded a review of Shin Godzilla, which mm -hmm. originally was going to go out before this, but it'll actually be coming a little bit later. It'll be coming in a month or two when uh, <laughs> when this was scheduled to go out, basically. So they've swapped places, but that's okay because we're still building up. In fact, one of the weirdest things about going to see this in the theater, one, I'd never seen a Japanese Godzilla movie in the theater before. I've seen most Same. of them, but not in the mm -hmm. theater. It was really surreal getting the trailer for Godzilla Cross Kong when I'm there to see a Godzilla movie. It was kind of, ah. I was like, huh, th there's so much Godzilla right now. It's, it's, yeah. it's so much to choose that was, from. That was actually when I was um, when I was explaining this to my girlfriend, of like, okay, I'm going to go see uh, Godzilla in theaters today. And she was like, okay, have fun. And I was like, right. Also remember in like three months time, <laughs> we're also going to see Godzilla in theaters. And she's like, wait, what? What's going on? We've we've got yeah we've got dueling countries making their own Godzilla movies. It's uh it's it's wild. So mm -hmm. uh yeah the basic premise of Godzilla minus one is that it's set right after World War Two and the main character is a kamikaze pilot who never went through with the kamikaze part. Uh, that, hence why he's still alive. But of course Godzilla shows up and yeah I mean I'll just leave it there. <laughs> I don't think yeah, because the... anything beyond that point is spoilers. <laughs> yeah. So we'll just we'll just leave it there and we'll we'll get into it. But uh, there was a lot of buzz going into this. I'd heard nothing but but positive uh, words yeah. uh, on the internet and elsewhere. So David, what did you mm. think of Godzilla minus one? It was mid at best. No, obviously not. It's it, this movie was great. I enjoyed every second of this. Obviously, uh, I don't think. I had seen any Godzilla movie in theaters, including the American ones. Oh. I think I always caught them after the fact. So this is my first time seeing Godzilla on the big screen, and hoof. And I think that was a good choice, because this is one where Godzilla is not just a monster. He is a force of nature. He is a god on screen. And I, I've i loved every second of this. Um, I think that this movie, strangely enough, feels the most cinematic the most I, the, the the word i was using when i was trying to originally work through my thoughts was the most hollywood it feels like it actually had the most like budget and work behind it than even the actual hollywood ones in the monsterverse and it really felt like they were gunning for some sort of award because even <laughs> without the godzilla stuff like everything here was just top tier the whole way through so 
Yeah, I kind of liked it. <laughs> All right. Well, before I get to my thoughts, yeah, I'm going to uh, go to some correspondence here. Um, mm. Some opinions from former Ace co-host Tara. Oh. Who, who Three set, episodes in, we're getting her back. All right. Who sent a message, giving our thoughts on Godzilla minus one? Okay. It's really boring and melodramatic. <laughs> Zilly is attacking humans seemingly because he hates them and not just because they're annoying ants. He looks great sometimes. Parenthesis, cutie pie. And sometimes yeah. he looks like a video game. People say crazy shit and no one reacts appropriately. I almost fell asleep multiple times. Wow. There's a well, reason why she's not on the show anymore, because this was fantastic, <laughs> okay? Godzilla Minus One was was phenomenal. I was excited going in. I, I was drawn in quite quickly. There was one or two mm. little things early on that I thought, oh, maybe I don't love this. But then, mm. you know, I let it cook. It told its story. And I think the thing that I came out of this more than anything else is that this has the best human character story yes. of any Godzilla movie, even more than the original. Now, I'm not saying the movie's better than the original. I still think the original Godzilla from 1954 is still the perfect Godzilla movie. It's still the most important. It's still all those things. Hmm. But in terms of human character story, this wins and nothing else even comes close. And it's so funny having just seen Shin Godzilla for the first time, how mm -hmm. much of the opposite this is. And because that did not have even a, it didn't even attempt to have a main character with a story. It was all nope. boardrooms. It was all the, the hole and the, the bureaucracy of everything. This was a main character who goes through something, who has an arc, who has something to, to work through to the point where Godzilla even kind of becomes a representation of something he's feeling. Dude, Godzilla uh, in this movie is nothing but symbolism, like if, if, the whole way through, and I love it because it's that's goes back just to the original Godzilla movie where he is this symbolic thing the whole way through. Yep, and on top of that, like I, I think you know I heard comparisons to Jaws, and there's definitely a portion mm. in the middle of the movie where I can see what that comparison is coming from. Yeah. We're like, oh yeah, we've got some dudes in a boat, and uh, I won't say too much here. I'll just say that instead of one shark fin, you've got the 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 roars of Godzilla spikes <laughs> coming out not, of the water. I'm not going to spoil anything, but they're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> they're going to need a much bigger boat. <laughs> In fact, at one point they get a bigger boat, and they still need a bigger boat. Honestly, like it would have been a cheap reference, and maybe even weird because this is you know set before Jaws came out. But if they mm -hmm. throw in the line, we're going to need a bigger boat. But like, you know what? This is the most justified use of that line oh, yeah. you might have ever said in cinema history, even more than Jaws. So yeah. it would have been totally fine. I'd have been okay with it. But no, they, they had they had enough class to to, uh, mm -hmm. to not do that. So no, I, I thought it looked great. I thought the music was top notch, both the original compositions, but also the fantastic use mm. of not only... Well, I, I can't say it's the original recording because it's not. It's all new recordings, but... The, right, but like the theme. The more traditional version of the theme, uh, but then also kind of a darker version or more emotional version. They kind of like have a few versions of it and it, it, mm -hmm. every time it comes up is very, very good. There, As we go into the third act, I won't say what's happening, but the, the theme kicks on mm -hmm. like right as the thing like starts and immediately I just like was overcome with this like childlike excitement of like, it's, yeah, it's happening. We're doing it. It's the call to action. It's the, there's mm -hmm. hope maybe we can do this and it kicks in at just the right time. Uh, even yep. just the sound design in general, there's a couple of times, one big one, especially near the end where the sound drops out completely to the point mm. where it's almost uncomfortable in the room. If you, Cause I had a, a room full of peep strangers in the room with me yeah. and it was almost uncomfortable how quiet it was. I'm like, Oh, you just, you just know there's that one guy across the theater who's like was about to cough and then the entire thing went silent. He's just like <laughs> <laughs> Um so real quick, um, because this is where it fits in best, I actually this is not a fault on the movie itself. This is a fault on my viewing experience. I don't know what in the hell was in the theater next to me. But there was, in, throughout every quiet moment of this movie, there was this, like, throbbing rhythmic bass that was coming through the walls. And it just, 
especially in moments like that it was just mm. like shut up man i don't want it just let me be in this moment i mean that sounds like your theater's uh sound like proofing or whatever is not yeah not just kept done properly that's what that's i mean probably i don't know is that taylor swift movie still out because that would have a throbbing bass that's just music yeah i was thinking <laughs> and i actually brought that up to my girlfriend because she went to go see that she's like no nah, it's not in theaters anymore i don't know what it was and i was like okay. all right well fair enough it. fair enough but i'm still my bet is still a concert movie of some kind just because it was yeah, consistent. probably but i think there's a beyonce thing that's coming out or maybe is already out so yeah so i think yeah this definitely feel <sighs> It felt like it's better than any of the human characters in the American movies as well, right? Mm -hmm. But I do think there's something to be said that this one feels so different to the rest of the Japanese movies in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, it's still to say the Japanese. It's all Japanese characters. It's set in Japan, and the themes are very much speaking to, you know, things that are important to, to that people. But in mm -hmm. terms of, like, how the other movies are all, like, written and play out and how they function this felt very different because it was this this personal story of one character and you know obviously it's affecting everyone but he is always the focal point he is always the yep. central thing that the stories uh that's not to say it's not got a good supporting cast because it absolutely does i i was very impressed one that i cared about uh his potential romance right uh, we'll talk about that mm -hmm. in spoilers but also the fact that he ends up with this little team that i ended up liking all of them in various ways yeah that's the that's as soon as we introduced that team in the movie i i immediately saw myself being like okay i get it these are going to be the guys that we like pal around with but they're not actually going to be the central focus but like no they get a good amount of development through this movie it, it felt like they actually were characters rather than just plot dressing i mean i, th I thought that yeah I, I mean the way i'd put it is i thought there were just going to be red shirts who were there to get killed just just mm -hmm. for more trauma and you know, not not to spoil if they if any of them do live or, or any of them die, but just the idea right. that no, they get more than that. They actually feel like real characters by by a point. They're making mm -hmm. good narrative points that are adding to the themes at a certain portion of the movie. So, yeah, I I, I was like super into. It. I think the opening is is good. I I, I don't want to I don't want it to sound like the opening is not good because it, it was drawing me in. There was just mm -hmm. some. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say that at the start of the movie, you see kind of a smaller, younger version of Godzilla. Yeah. And I think that design rubbed me weird a little bit, just because it, it felt a bit more like a dinosaur from Jurassic Park. Yeah. And Well, it's it's not to spoil anything, but the this movie overall takes place in post-war Japan. Yes. But this very first scene was still before the end of the war. So this is before any atomic bombs have been dropped. This is before any nuclear stuff. So Godzilla does not have his full function yet. He is essentially just a dinosaur at this point. Yeah. Well, I think the exact caption was the final days of World War II. So mm -hmm. I don't know... How much time was there between the two atomic bombs? Um, I think it was like a week, not even. I'm just wondering if it's in that week. I'm wondering if the first one's already been dropped. Uh, maybe. Yeah, could be. And I'm just thinking, because it feels weird to me to show any form of Godzilla before the atomic mm. bombs. Just thematically, or even if you're saying in plot, he's he's become what he is because people are dropping nukes. Yeah. Kind of thing. I, you know, I, regardless. But... It was sort of thing where I'm like, oh no, he's, he's kind of, he looks kind of like a, he's got the spikes in the back, but he looks kind of like uh, a Jurassic Park thing, and the way he's even mm -hmm. acting feels a bit more like a T Rex, um, and which is interesting. It's, it's maybe the only thing I could compare it to Shin Godzilla is that there's a younger, you know, non fully formed version earlier on in the movie before he, but that is the only comparison I could probably make because other than yeah. that, the movies are totally well. different. Yeah, that's the thing. This Shin Godzilla was one of the first ones that really had different forms of Godzilla showing him growing over yeah. time. This one is, I mean, it's not doing the same thing because it only really has the two forms, but it is still different versions of Godzilla within the same movie. So Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what. So to talk about the look of Godzilla in general, um, I think it looks great. Um, I love mm. that it feels like it's a, a building that's walking and like how stiff his legs are when he's yes. walking around. I really like mm. that. Um, I also think, despite the fact that they're using CG or whatever to to create Godzilla now, I love that they they can't like whenever you get a close up of his face or his eye, it still has yeah. that same look of the old suit where like the, mm -hmm. the eye looks just a little goofy, and the way that the 
the the the the skin around the eye sets i'm like they've went to the effort to maintain some of the charm which is especially impressive given just how like scary he's supposed to be in this movie how mm-hmm. much of a like you say this this god this titan who's who's going around but they kept yeah, a little no. bit of that charm in that design i like that yeah it's it's it, i think that's kind of what Tara was getting at is that certain times in this like he does have almost like a puppy dog look to him just because of the eyes having that older feel because i mean i can't remember exactly everything that went into his design but i always considered the face to be kind of like otter like Mm. and solely based on like just the way the pupils and the whites of the eyes are visible because modern godzilla the whites of the eyes are practically never visible it's just sheer lizard the whole way through yeah but as soon as you can see those whites of his eyes all of a sudden it becomes much more of a oh no that's just a suit like that's just a guy in a suit wearing that yeah i think it's interesting because i think i think that's one of the things I, I i wasn't as into in the first form is that because his legs weren't as bulky it did mm-hmm. feel like more like t-rex legs where it was a lot more mobile and i'm like that's not godzilla godzilla's not that mobile with his legs right he could he could dance with those legs i don't I, that doesn't work for me but i'm getting flashbacks to 1998 for some reason i don't know why well that's the thing yeah the godzilla which actually i had that thought like maybe we should do 98 godzilla when this was my <laughs> when it's like oh god because we've not done we've never done 98 godzilla we've done all the other american ones me and tyra did but never done... that's fair but we could also just do good things <laughs> We need to do an 88 Godzilla at some point. It has All to right, happen. Yeah. We'll, eventually, we'll get there. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, yeah, like the, the movement was kind of reminiscent of that to me. And again, like mm-hmm. it's not really that much of a complaint because it's not supposed to be fully formed Godzilla, and it is one scene, and the scene's mm-hmm. still very effective of, of, of what it's doing. So mm-hmm. I, I don't want that to come across even particularly negative. There was just kind of a, a, an initial little moment where I went, oh, he's, he's kind of moving more like a T-Rex, and that's a little bit weird. But it is just this early, I don't know, adolescent, well, shall we call yeah. it, uh, version of Godzilla. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I appreciated that there's not really too much that goes into, like, over-explaining things. Like, again, this is a super male thing, so I, I, don't, I, I would not consider this a spoiler. Uh, but the name Godzilla, there's not some, like, big, like, reason behind it. There's no big explanation of what the, the name means. It's just that before he's shown up, the, the the islands around that area have noticed that you know something's doing. You know the, the fish are acting strangely. Some of the fish are dying and raising to the surface, and they have just sort of created a legend that they've called Godzilla. I like mm. that. You know, it's not like oh, God comes from this and Zilla comes from that, and this is how we form the name. It's just no, no. Yeah. It's a local little superstition that because there were some effects that were showing, and then that name just stuck because fundamentally it's just a name, and I, I kind of appreciate that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's uh, one thing that the MonsterVerse, like, kind of annoyed me with in a lot of ways, Mm. is that they, when we eventually get to the point of, like, more and more Titans revealing themselves, they're all given these code names, which are just, like, super obviously the names that the monsters are supposed to be called by. And I'm like, I get it to an extent, but, like... You just know there was a marketing department sitting back in, like, Monarch that was like, hmm, if we're gonna sell a toy of Behemoth, should we call him Behemoth, or should we call him something else? It's like, no, I like the idea that, especially when it's Gojira more than Godzilla, that it is just this name that we don't know the etymology of. We don't know exactly how it broke down. It has nothing to do with Gorilla and Whale. It's just Gojira. That's all it is. Yeah. Yeah, I will say one thing just to defend the the monster verse a little bit. I did appreciate that in uh, King of the Monsters, like before they knew Ghidorah's name, they were calling him Monster Zero. That's actually yeah. a, a reference. That's what I was fine with. Yeah, yeah, because because he actually had that name as a code name in the old movies for a bit. Mm-hmm. See, that feels like a government naming scheme of like that's the first one we found. He's number zero. Continue yes. on with that pattern. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Uh, mm. So. Yeah, I think uh, I, I enjoyed the drama in this movie, which is not mm-hmm. something I tend to say when I come out of a Godzilla movie. It's usually something you, you put up with it, but it's not the, the showpiece of the movie, typically. Oh, no. Um, but here, like, I was so invested in the characters and I was so invested in the outcome of the main character's arc that going into that third arc when everything's ramping up and the music's kicking in, you, you I found myself being as invested in that as I would be something like the characters in jaws on their final Mm -hmm. like you know fight with the shark or or whatever it may be so 
I, I really want to compliment that and how much it affected me. I'm not saying there's not there's not any moments where they do go a bit more, I don't know, over the top and dramatic with how they chose to portray emotions in certain moments because that, that definitely right. does happen, right? Uh, mm-hmm. There's a couple of sort of moments you could argue are cheesy, but I would not complain about them. I actually think, you know what? I'm so relieved to have the cheesy moment. I welcomed it. I was like, yeah, you know what? I'm happy to have the cheesiness because it's it's making me feel better after how daunting that previous segment was or yeah. whatever it may be so yeah it's this it's this strange balance where if you have a setting that is fantastical and i think having a giant lizard god showing up qualifies as fantastical you you, you gotta really walk this line of you don't want your actors to be playing it too silly or else you're gonna end up with godzilla v kong but on the other side you don't want them playing it so seriously that it's like well I was here for fun monster stuff and it's not feeling fun anymore. And I feel like this movie did a great job of usually it lent more on the serious side, but it knew where it had to take a few little liberties and just dodge over to the camp for like a minute. And then there was a couple of genuinely good jokes that, you know, really landed a couple of good mm-hmm. moments, uh, a good, good, you know, cuts where it would cut to like a follow up that made the previous thing funny or something like that. I'll, I'll give an right. example or two when we get into the, spoilers but yeah yeah uh so yeah i i think for me the what you were saying of the humans being such a powerful story it really comes down to the fact that godzilla is just 100 percent symbolic in this and it's not of specifically a force of nature it's not even specifically of the atomic bombs what he's symbolic of and i don't quite want to spoil it yet but it is 100% 100% just reinforcing the human stories. It is it, not even just the main characters, just every single person you see, it reinforces their story and their drive to want to do whatever it is they need to do in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is there anything else we can really talk about before we start okay, spoiler territory? Um, not that i can really think of because like i said like anything after that first scene is just spoilers already so i'd say yeah jump on in i mean it looks uh, it looks fantastic i mean i'll just like i loved how the movie looked i think it stands yep. out as being one of the more distinct i mean i think shin godzilla was looked distinct as well i think mm-hmm. this sort of goes further though in making it this this period piece that is treated more like a drama where you get to know the characters and it really you know you're in the the post-war version of Tokyo where, you know, a lot of buildings are, you know, it's, the place is already destroyed before Godzilla ever shows up. You yeah. know, the buildings are already, like, half torn down and people are having to rebuild their homes and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Uh, the sad irony is, is that by the time Godzilla does come to land, it's like a year later and people have actually rebuilt some stuff, <laughs> which yeah, makes it really still, sad. they're still in the... One, one character makes the point of, like, oh, have you seen how fast the city's been rebuilding? It's great over there. And it's like, oh, lady, uh-huh. you just doomed yourself. Yes. Uh, so uh, yeah. So I'll just I want to mention that it looks so good. So, uh, sp- so before before spoilers, yep. uh, just want to remind people, even though this is a new release, I do have homework, and I will be doing that at the end of the episode. Oh, of course, yes, yes, yes. Very good, very good. Mm-hmm. Uh, excited to see uh what that is. But yeah, spoilers for Godzilla minus one. You have been warned. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I I th- <laughs> to start with, I just. The idea that we have this kamikaze pilot who chickened out, right? right, And I'm yep. not saying that because I see it as a negative, but I'm saying that's how you can just quickly describe what happened. He he, yep. he got scared and he pretended there was a fault with his plane, so he went to this small island where there's some mechanics who are specifically there to deal with any planes that have malfunctions. Uh, mm-hmm. But the mechanic's like, hey, I can't really find anything wrong with it. So you get the sense that, no, he didn't want to go through with it. And this is the... The, the crux of the whole movie is this idea that he was supposed to give his life. He was told that that was the honorable thing to do and he got scared and he, you know, he lives with this shame and Godzilla and a lot of, and there's obviously another part of here, but it, it gets added on to it, but Godzilla mm-hmm. largely in this movie represents his shame. It represents this towering, like just feeling inside that he does mm-hmm. not deserve to be here. He does not deserve to live and to, give himself a happy life and all these things and yeah that's just beautiful I th- it's beautiful i think that i think and we'll get to more of a reason why uh once he evolves but i think the blanket term to what godzilla mostly is is ptsd sure yeah it's this, 
it's this idea of he's been at war he he's has his shames he has things that he has to relive over and over again and that's exactly what godzilla is as it comes back and starts attacking japan post-war yeah i think it, what i love about it though is that it goes beyond just being ptsd it is a lot more specific when you get into the mm -hmm. the grittiness of specifically not, not even just with that character but it comes out and the theme is really beautiful in the third act with all the other characters actually yeah but this idea that he feels ashamed because he was supposed to give his life right that's what he was supposed to do and one of the first things that happens when he's back in tokyo is that the neighbor who lived next to his parents where he's now going to live is like you were supposed to die like all this happened because you're a coward and she you know mm -hmm. she lays it on thick to him and it's all about okay he's going through his penance and he can't he doesn't think he deserves anything and that affects his relationships throughout the movie which we'll talk about and it, when you yeah. when you get to later in the movie though one of the, the one of the things i think is so smart about this script is that when you get to later in the movie when so much other bad stuff's happened to him and he's been pushed to the edge where he's actually kind of finally like ready and brave enough to take the the, the you know the 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 dive the the the, mm -hmm. the suicidal leap if you will to save people the sacrifice that's probably the best word mm -hmm. for it he's ready yeah. to make the sacrifice by the end of the movie and that by that point in the movie though the the entire like trajectory of the of the mood has changed where other other people are now saying no it's horrible that people are asked to kill themselves for a war we should want yeah. to live like we are not fighting here to die for our country we are fighting here so that we and everyone else gets to live and it turns into this thing at the end where i love that the arc of the movie is him building up to where he's ready to finally make that sacrifice but by that point in the movie it's like no you're hoping for him to say no i want yeah. to live i want i i deserve to live i deserve to have all these things i deserve to have a life like everyone else mm -hmm. and you don't want him to make that choice i, I think the fact that that shifts and the third act, where you're now hoping mm -hmm. for him to not go through with it, is such a beautiful thing in the script. It's such a beautiful yeah. turn. Yeah, there's this... I, I feel like it does a great job of representing... And of course, I wasn't there. I don't know exactly how it felt. But it sure, feels yeah. right of post-war Japan, where there's this period of everyone is just kind of upset that they lost. Like, they're upset that, like, you know, Japan, mighty, strong. We have this image of strength internally. They lost this war and they not only lost it like by surrender, but they also lost like just like not even on their own terms. The bombs were dropped and that's it. Like the end of the war, that's all it took. So there's this idea of essentially just being like hurt by that on an, well, I don't know, like pride level. But then as time passes, passes on, as time moves, people like move on they understand like okay the war's over we we lost so be it now we need to come out of this and be stronger on the upswing and that's kind of what this mood is for the character where when he comes back yeah he is a direct representation of you didn't do your job right like he huh. it, because he's there it's a if you had done this maybe that would have been enough maybe you could have crashed into the ship that was so critical for all of this but then as time presses on, they realize, like, no, there was nothing we could have done there. And it's unfair of us to put that on you. So, yeah, yeah no, it's fantastic. Yeah, that's the thing. In hindsight, yeah, we know that one fighter pilot or one kamikaze pilot wasn't going to stop the nukes, wasn't going to make a no. massive difference in the war. But you get that they're looking for someone to blame. This neighbor who's he's saying all these bad things to him, she's lost her children in the war. Uh, mm -hmm. just as much as our main character Koichi he's lost his parents uh, and, and all this he comes back and is told very bluntly yeah they're not here anymore like you're going to have to deal with that yep. so yeah like all of this stuff is phenomenal so I think we'll work through it I, you know, I, but I just wanted to get the broad like theme of the movie out yeah. there before we, we, we it, dove in it 100% is a movie that examines post-war Japan and survivor's guilt hand in hand yeah survivor's guilt is a big part but i think it's especially poignant that because i think you can sell, tell survivor's guilt with anyone who survives a tragedy or a war or something like that mm -hmm. but the fact that his job was specifically not to survive it's like he yeah. has specific duty he failed to do is just an extra layer on top um and that's one of the things that comes up later on when they're you know when they're mounting their, their third act like you know this is what our plan is like very importantly they're like 
F the government, we're not trusting them. They don't care about human life. They just throw us into things. They, they had kamikaze pilots. That was the government deciding mm-hmm. to do that. We're going to do this as civilians. We're going to do this for the right reasons because we care about protecting everything. Uh, so there's definitely, you know, there's some critical elements in here, again, of, of the country's decisions. And that was something I suppose that was also in Shin Godzilla was the mm-hmm. bureaucracy of actually getting things done and making choices. So anyway, right. So the movie opens uh, in the final days of World War II with Koichi landing on this this little island and the mechanics come out and look at his plane. Yeah, his name is um, Koichi, but the thing that they call him over again, I think it's like Shinisaki or Shinisaki. Sh- Shikishima. Shikishima, that's yeah. That, Shikishima. That's his surname, yeah. Well, yep. depending on how they've written this, because I know Japan write it the other way around, so I never know if IMDb's written it their way around or our way around. But yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but Shikishima, yeah. He he is there, and but you know, he's very, there's a very tranquil start to this movie where he's looking out of the water. Obviously, he notices the some of the dead fish and stuff. Like, it's not even just fish, it's like, it's like sea life that's meant to be deeper. You know, it's not stuff that you typically see at the, the surface. Yeah, it's a bunch of fish whose, as far as I managed to read about it, their tongues have essentially like exploded out of their head because they've so rapidly gone from deep water mm. to like up top. Their hey! buoyancy has just exploded their tongue out. That's also relevant for the third act. Yes, it is. The, the, the pressure change is relevant for the third act. And, mm. um, you know, like, so there's this thing where the, the head mechanic, who's another important character, uh, mm-hmm. And this is that Tachibana, I want to say. Yes, Tachibana. Um, he like like we can't find any fault, and he's like, nah, don't feel bad. Like, yeah, like we're losing this war. Like we're definitely losing. Which is maybe also partly why I think the first bomb may have already fell, because that's mm-hmm. the attitude. But I don't know. I don't know for sure. I, I did look it up. It was a three day gap in between, so it's a very small period there. Yeah, but I mean, final days of the war. That could be in those three days. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but he's like, hey, now, look, you know what? I sympathize because there's no point in you throwing your life away for a cause that's already lost. Like, you know, the, mm-hmm. he's not judging him. But of course, uh, that night, young Godzilla comes up, up you know, up upon the land. So I'm just going to put this in here. Uh, yeah. This island that they're on, yes, there are locals and all that, but this is Odo Island. This is the same name, at least, of the island from the very first Godzilla movie, where... Oh, very they nice. first arrived on. So, a little callback there. I didn't notice that. I did notice later on in the city, they mentioned a theater being destroyed, which I'm pretty sure mm-hmm. was a theater that also got destroyed in the original movie. Yep. Um, I, I remember that one because they the original producers were like, some of the people are going to be watching our movie in that theater uh, as we're destroying it. Uh, more specific than that, the premiere was in that theater. Oh, was it? Yeah. yeah. That's, something, that's the one thing they kept faithful in the 1998 American movie is they had the premiere in Madison Square Garden because a lot of that movie takes place that in Madison Square Garden. Yeah. <laughs> of all the things you could have kept faithful, you pick that one. <laughs> I mean, it's a nice touch. It doesn't change what the movie is, though. <laughs> yeah, true. So, you know, Godzilla's attacking, and they all run for cover, because it's, you know, it, it's it's a T-Rex size, more or less. They're, they're running yeah. away from it. And the mechanic, uh, Tachibana, is like, hey, hey, your plane, it's got a big gunner on it. You, you can shoot at him. That, that'll take care of him you know it's a big it's a big <laughs> and obviously he's like yeah 20 millimeter rifle that'll kill anything and i'm sitting there in the theater going uh <laughs> yeah you may <laughs> wait to double check that <laughs> i mean to be fair young godzilla Maybe. without any sort of radiation or anything it's possible but uh you know so he hesitates though but he does ultimately run up to the, the plane and he sits in the seat but of course he he gets scared you know his hand starts to shake he freezes up and he can't yeah. do it. And then and this fits as well with the idea that he chickened out before. And again, I don't mean to say that in a negative way. I'm just using it as a sort of shorthand. Oh, yeah. No, well, I mean, even the movie puts it in those terms. It puts it in those terms of, at least in the beginning of the movie, that this is something that he feels shame about. Yeah. That it is him chickening out. So he can't do it. And then Godzilla starts like killing more of the mechanics who are very easy to mm-hmm. see in this darkness because they're all wearing white jumpsuits. So it was a re- yep. really good visual choice because it made it very easy to see it every time someone was getting killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but eventually uh, Shikishima just runs out the plane, he runs for it, and he ends up passing out. Uh, but when he wakes up, everyone is dead except the head mechanic, Tachibana. Who's got a? Mm-hmm. He's got an injured foot. He's sort of like dragging his foot along, and that's that's like a visual. It's a really good cue because later on, when we see him much, much later in the movie, we know mm-hmm. it's him because he's he's dragging his foot the same way. But yeah. so really smart little filmmaking choice there. But he's like, 
you you bastard they're all dead because of you you did this because you couldn't fire the gun yeah this is where the uh survival guilt really comes in like obviously he he was chickened out of the kamikaze thing despite it being his job to die essentially but this is the part where it's not so his other kamikaze pilots they were all going to die regardless of the choice he made that's not so much survivor's guilt this is directly on him he feels like if he were able to pull the trigger those men might still be alive yeah, and that's what tachibana it, accentuates as well and of course the audience we don't necessarily think that we we are pretty sure godzilla would probably would have still just killed them <laughs> but oh, yeah but he doesn't know that the, the characters don't know that so it makes sense mm-hmm. why he feels that way why tachibana feels that it's his fault and tachibana when they're on like a rescue ship going back to the mainland later mm-hmm. he gives them this little this little folder of all these photographs of all of the men that died and with their families and it's, it's basically a guilt book it's like here yeah this was you. You did this. They're all dead because of you. And these families... You're going to live with these ghosts for the rest of your life. Yeah, and the, the, the movie from there, like, it's a while before we get any more monster action, which I think partly is why they structured it this way, because they wanted mm. to give us a little bit of monster, because we're going to be doing some character building, we're going to be doing some drama, where he's back in the mainland, uh, you know, it's later that year, and he's living in like a you know half destroyed house but by the middle of the following year it's been rebuilt but of course some things happen by then we mm-hmm. we have the interaction with the neighbor but the big thing is that when he's out in the market um he gets lumped with a baby some woman runs up yeah. to him and hands him a baby because she's getting chased by the police or someone mm. and he kind of looks after the baby for a while until she eventually pops out again and she's like, oh, you didn't leave it behind. Um, and he's like, well, no, I'm not going to leave a baby in the middle of the market. I'm not crazy. Um, but she ends up following him home. And it's kind of this wonderful little weird relationship that blossoms where she just kind of sticks around and her and the baby mm-hmm. end up living there. And it's not her baby. This is an orphan. But, you know, a, a dying mother asked her to look after it. But it yeah. kind of forms this new weird little family. But of course, there's a lot of... Uh, intricacies about the dynamics between them as the movie goes on mm-hmm. because of well, how they what are I, what i really like though in this opening segment is that pretty much as soon as the uh woman stays the night uh he heads back outside and the neighbor lady who chewed him out before is basically like what what's with the girl what's going on there you you, you it's like she had a baby and all that and he's just like yeah it's not hers i don't know she's just taking care of it and the neighbor lady hears this and it's like oh so she can't breastfeed the baby and because she had young children of her own who died she's essentially able to take on the breastfeeding role she's not a full like mother it's more of a nanny position sort of thing but it's this start to basically be a little microcosm of the rebuilding of tokyo yeah of this idea of you can take these little disparate family structures and when people come together, they can just make it work. Uh, yeah, because initially she sort of butts her way in because she's, she recognizes that the young woman here, um, who is... Is that Sumiko? No. Uh, no, Nori- Sumiko is the nanny. Noriko yeah, is Noriko, the... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Noriko, mm-hmm. who's top build on IMDb, so I imagine she might be a celebrity in Japan just because it's she's possible. top build. But uh, Noriko doesn't seem to know what she's doing really she's obviously she's doing her best she's trying to look after this baby but she's she's not actually a mother she's not learned how to do any of this stuff so mm-hmm. the neighbor uh butts her way in and he's like no no this is how you do it blah blah, blah. and but then as time goes on you see them kind of rely on her where they'll ask her to watch the kid because they both have to do something that day um mm-hmm. and then later on when some big things go down and noriko's gone like she does become this relied upon neighbor this and she's and the little girl when she's a little bit older because we skip a few years ahead after this where she's a toddler mm. not even a few years well no you're right it is a few years yeah. for the toddler yeah yeah she uh you know she calls her auntie and things like that you know like we get mm. this this idea of like farming where there's this weird friendship that started with her blaming blaming uh shikishima for the death of her children and then as time goes on, she becomes this ally to him who's looking after his kind of daughter. And even that is a big part of the movie. Uh, just to talk about that now, the mm-hmm. the idea that as time goes on, he notably corrects the girl when she calls him daddy. Yeah. He says, no, I'm not your daddy. I told you this. And all of his friends, who we'll get to who all these guys are in a bit, we're not going into any of that, but mm-hmm. they're like, wait, why would you say that to her? Don't say that. That's damaging. Don't say that to her. And mm-hmm. you see that 
him and the Rico are living together and they're effectively functioning as a married couple. But when the subject comes up, it's like, yeah, we're not married. And at this point in the movie, I was even thinking, like, are you even romantically involved? Because it doesn't seem like you are, despite your yeah. situation. There's one point when he wakes up from a nightmare and we see that they're in like, they have a divider yeah, between yeah. their beds. Like they're essentially in different rooms. And she comes in and sort of checks on him and stuff. Yeah. Mm. And there's a couple of really notable interactions where he's like doing something and she, she's uh there's a scene where he comes home and she's like got like a, a smart outfit on and he's like hey what's this why are you wearing that and she mm-hmm. says oh I, i've got a job and he says oh don't i like provide enough money which is a very interesting thing to say like he's he's taking this role of provider when they're not yeah. actually a couple and she's like i, I just yeah. jumping in there yeah i think that 100 percent that backs up the idea that he feels like he has to self-sacrifice he has to give everything mm. he has for other people but he doesn't feel like he deserves anything in return yeah i think that's the big thing for me here is that he clearly clearly feels uncomfortable with the idea of her moving on and leaving and he feels uncomfortable that he's not providing enough for her because that's the first thing he says about it but mm-hmm. she has a line here which says yeah i have to go, go eventually because how are you ever going to find a wife and I didn't read that as her not wanting to be his wife. I read that as her. She she is oh, yeah. ex- she is accepted that he seems to not be interested in her that way. Well, it came right after the part where he was correcting the daughter. Is that the friends basically said like, "Oh yeah, she, your your wife here is beautiful," and he's like, "No, she's not my wife." And he's like, "Oh well, why don't you marry that?" And he flips out. He's just immediately like, "No, that's not what I want. That's not what I want to do." And he like all the friends get silent down, but the scene ends with just a slow fade out. It's a quiet shot on her. Yeah, on, yeah, on her washing the dishes just silently in the other room. Pro- probably like, having heard everything yeah. he's just said. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's this really like scene where you can really read into what they're actually saying. It's, it's not that she doesn't want that; she does want to be his wife. She does have feelings for him, but he mm-hmm. doesn't think he deserves a wife and a child and a and a happy life. He doesn't think he deserves happiness. And that's yep. something that really comes up. I mean, the way it's phrased at the end is that his war's not over. He's not back from mm-hmm. war yet. Even though he's physically here, the war's not over for him yet. And I mean, that's just the perfect description of what PTSD is. Yeah, yeah. It's this idea of you you don't leave the war on the battlefield. You take it home with you. Yeah, so we'll leave that there for now. But all that, like, I, I found myself getting really engrossed. Like, that quiet moment where the camera just focuses on her after he's sat at the table saying, no, I don't want to marry her. That's not what I want. And mm-hmm. the camera just sitting in her quietly. It's such a somber little moment of like, oh, I just felt the movie told me that that's important what he just said and that she just heard it. The movie's oh, yeah. doing such a good job of making the little moments that are especially important, the smaller moments that that just, I was very impressed by that. And like, I could see a lesser movie doing like a whole thing of her like standing around the corner and the camera like pans and mm. shows that she was listening or you see like a tear falling down her cheek or something like that. But no, this is just... This was more it, powerful. This was yeah. infinitely more powerful because you don't see a reaction. You just see her quietly standing there. Mm-hmm. So, so good. Uh, so to go back, uh, you know, I think that's a good place to leave that there because we'll get mm-hmm. all the big climax stuff and the big attack with her later. Um, yes. To go back to... It's not a subplot, but it feels I'm t- I'm calling it a subplot because it's almost like its own mini arc of the movie, which is he gets a job um, on a boat looking for mines, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. That's that's like a big part of the setup of this movie is that he needs work, right? So he gets this job and he comes home and says, "Hey, I got a job today, and it pays like eight thousand yen or whatever the number was." I mean, I mm-hmm. have no context for how good that is and what time period, but it doesn't matter. So I was gonna say that's that's yeah. not only is it back in the 40s it's also a different currency i have no idea what that is and yen's always in the thousands like a loaf of bread mm-hmm. is thousands of yen so i don't <laughs> i i know that in modern day i think a hundred yen is a dollar okay. so if that held even back then that would be about 30 bucks payment yeah but 30 dollars in the 40s is a lot more. right exactly yeah. especially in post-war japan that probably would be able to get you a decent amount but she's like oh this this pays great are you sure it's like legit and he's like no it's from the government it's definitely legit which is again interesting that he's taking this job from the government which this movie is clearly very critical of and this whole job Mm -hmm. the reason why it pays so well is because it's risky because it's about going and looking for all these mines that have been left after the war by both sides Mm -hmm. and that again ties into this theme of the government just paying the civilians to go and do dangerous work because it doesn't value human life in the way it should um so the, one of the funny cuts of the movie, though, here is that he tells, he says to her, "Don't worry, I'll be on a boat 
that is that is designed that's specially designed for this that's designed for mines right and it cuts to him at the docks looking at this sh- little wooden shack of a boat and he's like <laughs> this is especially designed for mines and i think what i like about this not only is it really funny but once the captain actually explains why they're using this boat, I went, yeah, okay, you know what? This is actually a safer option. It's just that yeah. it's not very specially designed. The reason why they're using this little wooden boat is because these mines typically are magnetic, and this is a wooden boat, mm-hmm. so it's safer because it's not going to attract the mines. I'm like, you know what? That actually does sound reassuring. I'll, I'll give it to you. It does. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, as much as specially designed means we didn't have a magnetic base, like, Fair enough, but it also does feel like this boat existed prior to the job and oh, for probably sure. outdates it by several decades. Th- this is just happenstance. This is not specially designed, but yeah, um, it was a really funny cut, though. But again, it showed mm-hmm. you her concern that she was like, oh, no, we can't lose you. And again, it's a very mm-hmm. intense conversation to be having with someone who you're not in a relationship with, <laughs> mm-hmm. but somehow you're acting as this family and pretending that it's not. It, it's a really interesting thing and obviously throughout the movie you've got the little girl doing drawings of mummy and daddy and stuff which yeah. is, is playing on the whole idea that the, you've got this life you're just not accepting it mm-hmm. so yeah the boat so the crew yes the crew yes yes so there's three characters here that they got added to the movie uh we have the scientist who we'll call doc he doesn't like that name mm-hmm. but that's what everyone calls him so he's doc yep. uh we have the captain who is yeah, his captain yeah he's got a bit of an attitude a He's kind of this wise guy who, who who has been in the war. And then there's the kid who, he's not actually a kid. He's just the youngest and he's the rookie in the sense that he he's, he's not been in war. He's not had yeah. time in service. So that's, that's a, honestly his biggest character thing is that these three guys, uh, the doc was involved in like naval research and stuff like that, but he was involved in the war. Yeah, making weaponry the, and things like that, yeah. Yep, yeah, the captain was obviously out doing his part, but the kid was the only one out of the group who basically it ended before he was able to be drafted in and he is actually kind of wistful for that he he wanted to do his part he wanted to go out and be yeah. a soldier uh, and we can come back the, to that because there's, there's a really good moment later on that, that brings that up i so yeah. I, I think we'll leave well, that for there but yeah well there is the one bit that is in this opening scene where basically uh the entire role that shikishima is showing here is that when these when this boat goes out, it has this special anchor essentially that cuts the ropes that are holding them to the uh, ground. Yeah, there's, that's a, holding there's them a underwater. There's a second boat, and they've got like a, a line going between them. So we, we never really meet mm-hmm. the crew. It's on the second boat, but we know that they don't, we know that they're there. Uh, yeah, and so then the mines float up, and the only way to dispose of them safely is to get some distance and then fire at it. So they need Shikishima to be a sharpshooter, which he had decent training with. Yeah when he was planning to be a kamikaze pilot. So he, the captain tries showing him what to do, misses all the shots, Shikishima shows up, immediately hits it with the mine, and that's where the kid steps up, and it's just like, oh man, that's so cool, I wish I could have been part of the war, if only it'd go on a bit longer. And Shikishima immediately just turns around, grabs the kid by the collar, and just like, you better not mean that. Yeah, it was a powerful moment, yeah. Yeah, it's just this extra little thing where it's, it's not like he's, like actually angry or anything at the kid it is just this ptsd response of like you don't want it to last longer you don't know what you're talking about yeah and i think the other two characters completely get you Mm -hmm. know maybe maybe they weren't as quick to jump and grab him or anything but i think they understood why he reacted the way he did to that statement Mm -hmm. uh so yeah we get like a bit of a montage here uh where we we go through a bit of time up to the middle of 1946 or or Mm -hmm. so even maybe even beyond that where you get uh, these characters going out and they're disposing of these mines. They have some camaraderie. Uh, you know, we get that scene where they're over for dinner, which is where we have all that conversation about who the kid is, who you know, what the marriage situation is and all that. And we also get that, yeah, he's making some money. They've rebuilt the house. It looks kind of nice now. And he's, he's got a little motorbike now <laughs> and stuff like yep. that. So right in the middle here is where the movie splits with its framing for a while, just like a minute long sequence. And we get a American military film reel. That's right. Of, oh, I forgot about this. Yeah. Yeah. So we basically get to see, you know, the, the attacks on the, or the testing on bikini atoll. And we see all these nukes going off and everything like that. And then the entire sequence ends with Godzilla's eye opening up underwater. And it's clear that he was part of this nuclear testing. 
Yeah, so it's the Cold War's fault that Godzilla eventually came out yep. and did what Blame he did. Blame it on the Russians, like everything else. Well, that was the thing, yeah, it was the part of the movie. That's just, it's almost a footnote, but later on, the military are like, now we or like the American military want to help with Godzilla, but mm-hmm. it can't because if it moves its ships anywhere around Japan, it'll be seen as aggressive by the Soviets. So it kind of like rules out both American and Soviet help in a yep. way. I don't think that the Soviets would ever consider it for help, I suppose. But, you know, like the Americans can't intervene because they feel like the Soviets will react poorly to their warships mm-hmm. coming in you know so yeah and i do i do want to bring up here because you said that like they don't trust the government to do this stuff when we get into the third act it is worth noting that up until i think it was 1956 the japanese government was banned from having a military period oh like, sure they, yeah they did not have any way to actually respond to this on their own in any meaningful way so it kind of came down to civilians in the end Okay, I mean, okay, maybe my phrasing was wrong, but there's definitely an anti-government sentiment to the way oh, they yeah. talk about how the government valued human life. and I think that there's an anti-government sentiment for, like, the wartime, for the way that they treated yeah. people during the war. For, for sure. sure. Um, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, even after uh, that time period, though, like, uh, the, like they're only allowed it for defense, though, right? They're not allowed to... Yeah, well, that was the whole part yeah. in Shin Godzilla. They have yeah. very specific rules of when they're able to engage. Yeah, that's a it's an interesting bit of history, sort of dealing with mm-hmm. that. Um, but I, yeah, this all builds up, of course, to the set piece of the move. Well, that's no, no, I'm not even there yet because we, we've got yeah. all, we've got the jaws stuff to do. Hold on. Yeah, we got the jaws stuff. <laughs> we got the jaws stuff. So yeah, because all this stuff's going on, and there's like reports of ships being attacked or turned over or whatever, and they mm-hmm. go out to where the ship's been attacked, and their boat's been ordered to go out there along with another boat or two. And they're like, okay, we're all out here, but what are we doing here? Like, they're just, they're just kind of, a, they're miffed about the whole thing. They don't really understand it. But of course, yeah. when they're out here, Shikashima looks down at the water at one point and sees some floating dead fish and is like, oh no, oh no. And it's, it's almost like that PTSD flashbacks of, oh, the, the war's coming back to me. It's that, yeah. it's that famous gif of the, uh, the dog staring at the cake or whatever it is. Yeah, the and cupcakes. It, yeah. And it flashes. <laughs> it flashes like Vietnam or whatever. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so stuff. <laughs> i mean you're right it's not it's not that dissimilar um but this is the one point where uh doc reveals that he's actually like he knows a little bit more about what's going on he's been told the full mission here yeah. more or less yeah it's... which is essentially that they they were told that there is a large creature coming they don't know much more about it than that obviously they didn't have the name godzilla well it's shikashima who, who as soon as that said shikashima basically mm-hmm. jumps in and says godzilla and they're like what yeah. Godzilla. That's another. That's another thing I like in this movie that Shikishima gives the name Godzilla, but I don't think it really spreads. I don't think he really shares that name around. Like no one really says it that much afterwards. It, it's kind of well, in like official terminology. Yeah. Well, it almost it, kind of works in the if we're saying that it, it represents his shame and PTSD. Mm-hmm. The idea is your shame is not something you want to talk about. So he's not uttered that word. He's not even tried to tell people that he saw a monster on that island. He's not talked to, no. because that because that attack represents his shame because of what he failed to do and what, how he failed to, you know, mm-hmm. do anything to help. So yeah. the idea that like he's even saying it out loud feels like, yeah, he's reliving this now because he said the name. So it's, it's mm-hmm. very you know, symbolic it's all in that way. Back, yeah. yeah. So anyway, the entire thing is that they have been told this monster's coming. And there is a large warship that they've basically, the U.S. and Japan have managed to finagle as being allowed to help them is on its way, but they need to essentially stall for time. So they're here to, if they see Godzilla, make it so that he doesn't reach the mainland until this ship shows up. Yeah, this is definitely the best stuff in the water I think I've seen with Godzilla because it, it mm-hmm. definitely, it absolutely does kind of play it like a huge version of Jaws where he starts you know he, he takes out one of the other ships or whatever and he's swimming around he takes out the the the, the sister ship you know the other one that the other assistance the ship the sister boat it's not big enough to yeah. be a ship <laughs> and it's it's so brutal too because like they're both just sitting there they both see like all the fish showing up yeah. and they're like all right buddy you ready we're gonna we're gonna hook ourselves a big one and then you just see godzilla just up down ship is gone yeah just obliterated so of yeah. course they you know they start moving right so we get these gorgeous shots of Godzilla like chasing them and you can see all the fins in the water which is very like Jaws 
But then mm-hmm. you also, but obviously there's a lot more of them because it's Godzilla's back. Oh yeah. Right. But then there's that great moment where like the top of the heads, like almost like an alligator, just kind of like dipping out of the water, and you can see his mm-hmm. eyes, and it's coming for them. Um, and this movie in particular, and I'm not going to say that none of them have done this before, but this idea that if Godzilla does get damaged, he just regenerates like he's like a mutant, <laughs> where mm-hmm. his, his flesh just grows back, because they're like, hey, we've got a couple of these mines on the boat that we've, we've, we've brought up, the, the ones that were safe to actually just transport. Like, what mm-hmm. if we, like, try and hit them with those? <laughs> so they, they try, and, you know, the, so we get this big, great set piece moment where Godzilla's chasing them, and they're like, trying to drop mines into the into the water mm-hmm. um and shikashima has to shoot one of them and he does he does hesitate a little bit but he's able to sort of get through it and like, no no so this is like almost his first step to recovery where he like okay i'm at least willing to take the shot now admittedly he doesn't really have much of a choice now like he's, he's it's not like he's hiding from godzilla if he doesn't take this shot yeah it's it's a thing where the original issue was he was supposed to take the shot and if it didn't kill godzilla then Godzilla would come after him. Yes. It was essentially, he had to do this, and if he failed, he would die. This one is, he's going to die no matter what. Like, unless he does this, he's going to die. So this is yeah. more of a self-preservation thing while still also being a fight against Godzilla. Yeah, so he gets over it, but obviously it's not a, it's not a complete arc change or anything because he's mm-hmm. not, he's, you know, again, he's, he's kind of backed against the corner right now. Right. But yeah, they get this thing and we get that big moment where they get one in its mouth and they shoot it and it blows out the side of his face, but then it just Mm -hmm. mutates back and they're like, well, shit, we are screwed. And Godzilla raises up out of the water and he's about to do his iconic roar. You could see him building up for it. And then all of a sudden, Deus Ex Machina, the giant ship that they were waiting for, shows up and starts firing on Godzilla. Wow, well, yeah, they, they set it up, so I wouldn't see it as a Deus Ex Machina. Oh, no, no, it's, it's not. But like, it's in, just a last minute exact, save. <laughs> oh, yeah. But in that exact moment, like, you could tell the, the entire audience, for my theater at least, we, like, we all knew the roar was about to happen. He, he pulls back, he raises up, and then boom, cock block. Well, and I'm like, oh, I get it. Admittedly, with hindsight from later on, because you see what happens when he does it, you know mm-hmm. he's not here now. But I think in the moment, I thought he was maybe going to fire his atomic breath at them. I thought it was literally uh, going to be a, a fire. Obviously, later on, we see there's a bit more of a visual indicator that he's going to do that, but we didn't mm-hmm. know that at the time. So, yeah, like, so this ship engages it, and then Godzilla starts taking on the ship, and it's, it's just, it's enough for them to be like, well, <laughs> I guess we can get out of here now. That's... Well, yeah, they they start running, and then Godzilla just starts tackling down the ship, but they keep on firing at it. They keep on trying to do some damage, and obviously, Godzilla is able to just tank whatever hits there are. But what he ends up doing that, as you were saying, the build-up to this atomic breath scene, he goes underwater, underneath the ship, and just shoots straight up. Yeah, we see... And the ship just explodes. So we don't get to see everything that builds up to the, the breath, but we do see just this glow of light coming from underneath mm-hmm. and then yeah the beam comes up uh one of my favorite moments though is that when he is just kind of like bumping up against the ship uh his face is right in front of the big mortar cannons that are on the ship and they, mm-hmm. they shoot him right in the face and it it, it mildly annoys him i think is the best yeah. way to describe it he's just kind of like ah we piss off they, i i think that shikishima and probably doc at that point have made the realization that like you can't hurt it from the outside its skin is too tough the only reason they managed to do any damage at all was because they managed to get the mine into its mouth yeah and then explode it and that's the whole reason why there was even that little bit of damage they did so yeah like they oh that's like they ended up but that's a big this, this is your first big huge set piece sequence is this mm-hmm. stuff in the war and it's very good and it's not even that long until the next big set piece because nah. it, it, it's now a countdown to it like i think someone actually says ah i'll never come out of land it's fine <laughs> it's like yeah. you know it's it's you know it's, just, it's not a concern but sure enough um it's actually is it our first day at our new job uh like- no some time has passed here this is actually um okay. we get the scene in between so he goes he's hospitalized he has a bandage wrapped around his head uh for a very large portion of this movie and when he gets back he has that opening up heart to heart scene with noriko oh yeah this, this is fantastic yeah uh where yeah this is where it sort of gets to the, the crux of it where he kind of opens up and just kind of admits how he feels about some things and it's, mm-hmm. it's this really sort of emotional scene that ends with her holding him 
Like, he's very mm-hmm. vulnerable because he's finally opening up about a lot of the things that he doesn't deserve certain things, that he's ashamed of who he is. And yep. This it, is where we first get the uttering of that phrase of, like, my war isn't over. Because, uh, yeah, it, it makes sense that it comes after seeing Godzilla again. It, you know, he's, mm-hmm. he's confronted with that shame, like, face to face. And she she's effectively trying to again further this relationship in some way she's like no open up like i'm here like I, i'm here because i you know i care like yeah. tell me something and yeah we get this beautiful really somber scene uh that ends with him huddled and her just with her arm around him uh mm-hmm. which yeah leads to her going to work on i'll just call it g-day which that's what the american movies call the attack on san francisco so i mean yeah that's fair uh, yeah g-day i think works better than anything else uh, mm-hmm. where she's on her way to work and we've not really because they're in Tokyo but they're in like a specific section of Tokyo and we've mostly stuck around the housing area and the markets and things we've not really went into the, the city proper where this monorail mm-hmm. is that she's on where uh, you know all the bigger buildings are right we've not really been it's there a, much yeah it's a town called Ginza and that's where they specifically mentioned beforehand that they were doing a great job at rebuilding like pretty much Ginza has been entirely fixed up post World War Two raids yeah, and she's on the train, and one of my favorite moments of this because there's a bit of build up to Godzilla like coming ashore, but one of my favorite mm. moments uh, is when the main theme, the da 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 da, when that kicks in, it's when she kind of sees him for the first time, and he almost kind of like walks out from behind the building uh, mm-hmm. as she's on the train. It's a glorious moment, and one of my favorite things about the music here is that. The first time you hear it, it does the the, the angry bit that's the start of Godzilla's theme. But there's the more kind of like upbeat part, the na 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 right? It does like the the chords from that, but it doesn't do that full-fledged here. It does a more dramatic, just the chords, so you get the sense of it, but... And, you know, it makes sense that it's the, a dramatic version of it because as this is happening is when her train has been ripped in half and she's literally holding on for, yeah. for life. And... She's actually able to survive this particular part because she re- she looks down and realizes that the half of the train that's been held up now is over some water. And she's like, well, mm-hmm. the only chance I've got is to actually fall into this water because I might survive that. So she does, right? And we see mm-hmm. her stumbling down the road uh, uh, in a minute. Meanwhile, uh, Shikishima, realizing that she's in the area that Godzilla's like stomping around in, he, yeah. he starts running like he- for the city. He's like, oh, I need he to get em- to her. The emergency broadcast signal goes out, like it's all over the radio, and she's like, oh, crap, did they say Ginza? So he just dumps the kid with the nanny and then runs off. And I think this is so special because at this point in the movie, he's really not opened up. I mean, he, 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 he became vulnerable. He told her about how he feels, right? Mm-hmm. So he's definitely more connected to her than anyone else in the movie at this point. But he's also yeah. not opened up and admitted his feelings for her. He's not sealed the deal, if you will, right? Yeah, it basically seems... Uh, obviously there might be some time passing but it does seem like it is just a one day period of that stuff happened last night where he opened up and then she went to work the next day it strikes me as a sort of thing of if this didn't happen by the time she got home that day she would have like he would have fully opened up to her and been like look you know i'm making some great strides emotionally here i want (laughs) us to be a family let's do that but yeah but the, the, my point being is i think this now that she's under threat of death he a, he's realizing there's a, a there's a chance of losing her and how that makes mm-hmm. him feel and also the idea that he's not told her how he feels he's not told her yeah. how important she is to him so there's a lot of weight and, behind him running to the city to try and get to her during this moment yeah. and also add on the fact that it's godzilla which he still feels responsible for he still feels the yeah. fact that he didn't kill Godzilla <laughs> yeah. to begin with. He He's going to take the blame for everything that happens to this city. He's going to mm-hmm. put that on himself, regardless if he should or not. He is going to feel shame for that. He's going to feel the guilt of that. And yep. he's running to the city, and he does run into her, and Godzilla's stomping around, his tail's whipping at his things. I guess here, we'll just to pause for a second, there's a whole mm-hmm. little mini-sequence here where there's like reporters on a rooftop who are doing running commentary for the radio, talking about Godzilla and what he's doing. And they're like, uh-huh. oh, we're very close now, he's right in front of us. And I'm like, guys, do you, you see the buildings just like fall down around you? Maybe it'd be a good time yeah. to leave. And of course, the building ends up tipping over, and we get this great shot of them sort of like sliding down the roof to their mm. demise um but i was like yeah you, 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 you I mean, guys are the, 
the whole sequence of Godzilla, like right up until the last few shots, which are obviously powerful in their own right, but it is essentially just a recreation of the first Godzilla movie again of he obviously Godzilla took like a little tram train in his mouth and was uh, tearing it apart that yeah. way. And then he went and destroyed the theater as well. It's pl- paying homage to that original movie in very subtle but noticeable ways. But there's characters we care about that are in direct jeopardy, which yep. elevates a lot of it and makes it feel like there's a new take here. And Godzilla does feel evil. He feels evil in this scene mm-hmm. uh, with just how how much he's going after everything. And like you say, like so the big thing towards the end of this, of course he uses atomic breath, right? There's some key yes. points here to, to bring up. Is that one... When he fires his atomic breath, when it actually hits, it is literally a nuclear bomb. A mushroom cloud yeah. comes up, right? The they they show like the shock wave hitting the city. It may as well have just been that same stock footage from like the Trinity test of just all of the buildings being immediately knocked yeah, down. I, I, I was it's, thinking, um, it's hard not to think of that dream from T two with when she thinks yeah. of the nuke going off in the city. I mm-hmm. was like, this this is just a nuclear bomb going off, basically, and. Yep. There's this really dramatic moment here because they've found each other, right? Shikishima has found uh, Noriko and he's embracing her and they're trying to get to safety and she sees this shockwave coming and she pushes him into an alleyway and she just goes flying with the, the wave. She just goes yep. and he's like, you know, luckily, you know, th- this building's a little bit stronger. They're far enough away from the epicenter, whatever. You know, you can talk about, like narrative leeway here of like oh th- this building happens to stand up and protect him look yeah. it's a story right he has to survive <laughs> i think they make it believable enough in the story itself whether or not you you're a physicist who knows exactly the destructive potential of godzilla so be it but if for an a- an average audience viewer it's perfectly fine yeah it doesn't matter i do not give a yeah. shit right i yeah. do not care um and one of the most powerful moments of this movie to me is when he comes out after the shockwave settled down and he falls to his knees and just screams and cries in pain and agony as he's yep. looking up at Godzilla, who's just standing there, just towering over the city. No demolished cities, it might be add. Mm-hmm. The, the, that moment as he's screaming out, and it, the movie intentionally makes a choice here to fade to black. It doesn't cut to the next mm-hmm. scene. It fades to black slowly as Shikishima is in pain. He's lost the one person he's come to care about. And he probably feels like, not only does he feel guilt over it, obviously, because he thinks, oh, maybe I could have stopped Godzilla way back before this all happened. But now mm-hmm. the one person I cared about is also directly being killed because of Godzilla. Yeah, no, and I, I think this scene also does a fantastic transition as well, where leading up to this point, it has been, Godzilla is a symbolic representation of his shame, his PTSD. But with this essentially nuke being dropped in Tokyo, this has now shifted Godzilla to being the PTSD of the country, Mm. of Japan as a whole, of we just went through two atomic bombs like two years ago. It still is something that sits fresh for us, and it just happened again. I think I would even go more specific than that and say it's the PTSD of the people of Japan as opposed Mm -hmm. to Japan as a governmental body, right? Because I think where the movie goes and the themes and the things that it talks about, I think, like, I get what you're saying, but I'm just, I think one's just to to make it clear. It's the Mm -hmm. people of the country. It's not the the body of the country, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But, like, because I think that's the thing that I got out of the third act of this, is that, no, these people are people. We should care about them. Um, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's like when we're watching Oppenheimer and we're saying, yeah, the scientists at a certain point were like, hey, we don't want to kill all these people. This is actually horrific. Um, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what we're winning here. Uh, the, the human element of this, you know, it's, I, I think it's really interesting watching this and, and watching a movie that is set in a, in a place where right at the end of the war, which was on the opposing side to at least, you know, yeah. of, 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 you know, the countries that we're both from, like where we are, Japan was on the other side. And mm. it is kind of an interesting thing to look and go, no, the people in the country aren't just evil because they were on the opposing force, you know, in, in a war. Yeah. That's kind of... Every anti-war sentiment basically gets boils down to the vast majority of the people involved are actually just innocent people who are being thrown to yeah. the slaughter. 
I mean, that's the thing. People don't rage wars. Like, sure, as you get high enough up, there are people making decisions. But in the yeah. end, it's governments that wage war. It's groups that wage war. The individual people, they just want to live whatever better life they can. Yeah, so I, all that stuff is super powerful. That sequence in the middle was just like, okay, yeah. this movie, like... I was really liking it up to this point. I think, I actually, I think the emotional breakdown scenes where I'm like, okay, I think this might be special. But this was like, okay, they're nearly this side of it as well. Like, this, this, mm -hmm. we're full on into like one of the best Godzilla movies of all time here without much of a. I really wish that you gave timestamps for when Terra fell asleep or was close to falling asleep because if it was anywhere <laughs> around this scene or anywhere after this scene, then just. The last 200 uh, episodes of Ace are invalid. I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, I did not get a, a, a beat for beat itinerary of yeah. what happened. But so at this point in the movie, like the atmosphere has taken this this hit, right? And everyone's mm -hmm. pretty desolate. And they're somberly like I think the first thing we get after this is kind of the the, the funeral like dinner, right? You know, it's where well, him and the other characters are in black suits and they're they're talking about it, right? Yes, but immediately in between those two is essentially this scene where people are gathered outside of like the damage perimeter mm -hmm. and they're not allowed in because everything is still radioactive. Everything is still crazy, oh, which sure, just yeah, yeah. adds more and more to that idea of this was a nuclear bomb. Like this yeah. is going to leave longstanding damage. Yeah. And not the first time, by the way, I think his atomic breath has caused effectively a mushroom cloud. I think that has happened mm -hmm. in like one or two of the 90s movies. So nah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Not a completely like new thing, but uh, it's just given out. so much more weight here. Oh, for sure. Like, yeah, even yeah. Because of just modern CGI and modern cinematic techniques, it's just given this incredible feeling of because like it's not a thing where he shoots his atomic breath at the ground, like even like a hundred feet in front of him, 200 feet from him, or like the nearest building, like it zaps through the entire city skyline yeah. and only hits like hundreds of meters away. So yeah, the, the tone afterwards, when now this little girl's lost the woman she calls mom, and mm -hmm. there's this kind of, you know, what, one of the big things here is, as it goes on is that the, the captain, right? Cause at, at this point they do feel like a group of friends and they're having, mm -hmm. they're at this funeral dinner together. Later on, we see them having drinks together and talking about what's going on. Um, one of the things that runs throughout this back half of the movie is the captain keeps telling them, like, you know, you, you need to be there for that girl. You better not orphan her. You better not give up. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to be there for her. Um, and you should have told told Noriko you loved her when you had the chance. Like, you should have done these yeah. things. They, they specifically mention uh, around this time where it's like, look, we're, we're coming up with an idea to fight against Godzilla. It's something that we're looking into. Are you interested in helping us? And of course, Shikishima jumps on that. But the captain calls him out just being like, OK, but are you doing this out of revenge for killing Noriko? Because if that's the case, you should have said something before now, boyo. Yeah, that's on you. Because we get this big meeting scene where... They're basically trying to recruit people because this is not, again, it's not a military thing. It's not a government thing. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the people who are running it are ex-military. You know, the, the, the guy comes in to like sort of run the operation is like a, an admiral or something like that. But it's like... Hey. And most of the people that show up are like former Navy yeah. as well. And it's like, hey, we were all asked to put our lives on the line. This time, though, it's not going to be like a forced thing. This is something you got you get to choose to do. And uh, Doc explains what the plan is. Like, okay, we've got mm -hmm. this sort of rough idea here. We're going to do this thing where we attach these devices that'll sink Godzilla. We're going to attach some of these things that do something with uh, gases that'll make him plummet, right? It's it's essentially the oxygen destroyer from the first one, but now it actually has some scientific basis behind it. Yeah, but it's yeah, it's, it's less. Uh, that sounds more based on basic chemistry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, and then it's like okay, but there's a phase two where if that doesn't completely kill him then the change in pressure of coming back up, mate. And yeah. everyone keeps saying, okay, well, what, you know, can, can you say if this is going to kill him? And he's like, well, I can't guarantee anything because Godzilla is this unknown entity. Like, we don't know for sure if anything will kill him, but these two things would kill anything else on the planet. So it's, it's the yeah, best they, choice we they, have. They specifically are dunking him down into like this huge 
like crevice in the ocean floor that's like yeah, it's the deepest, 1500 meters yeah they down. say it's the deepest trench that's close by it's the, you know, the, the deepest place near japan that they can find mm. that they can and they're getting him they want to the plan is to get him down there within like 30 seconds so there is absolutely no way that he can acclimate himself at all it's yeah. going to be just immediately down and crushed by the pressure and then they've got like a test thing which is basically just a big inflatable bed that just quickly inflates and the idea is that we're going to set these off like the devices that have the first thing are also going to have these on them and then mm. we can make them rise up through the water again very quickly the idea being that the the pressure changing and that goes back out of the fish at the start is that as he rises mm. up that should hopefully kill him and no yep. one knows for sure if that'll work and like obviously the you know some of them leave some of them don't volunteer but enough of them mm-hmm. do and this is actually i think where we get that what this really great scene with the captain and the kid where yes the kid is like oh yeah okay we're going to do this blah blah, blah. and the captain says okay we're all going to go but you're staying here and the kid's like wait whoa whoa, whoa wait what like what, what no i want to go like i wasn't in the war yeah. and, the, and to be fair the reason why they're not bringing him it's not because he wasn't in a war it's not because he doesn't have the experience he could still be useful but in the earlier attacks in the movie, his arm was broken, so he's got like a mm-hmm. like a cast and like a, a sling on, and yeah. they're saying, "No, look, you can't. You, like you're injured." And this is the moment where the captain turns around and says, "Not being in a war is something to be proud of, right? Mm-hmm. That this this guilt or the you know this this desire you have to prove yourself, you should be happy and thankful that you were never in that fight." And they walk off and leave him yeah. behind, and he the kids left standing there saying, "Please take me with you." And it's a really effective little moment, I thought. Yeah, well, I think it does a great job. Obviously, this isn't something the movie really gets into, but it goes into this idea of like before my ver- viewing of the movie, there were a bunch of just ads that had nothing to do with trailers coming out. They were just general ads, and one of them was. For the U.S. Marines, it was a mm. thing where they had this whole long sequence of like, oh, the few, the proud, the Marines. I feel like it's one of those things. Even back in World War II, there's this idea of honor and valor. And there's something that's just, you know, fighting for your country, doing something right. And I have to imagine wartime Japan was printing out that propaganda like wholesale nonstop. Oh, sure. Yeah. And this kid, despite the fact of not being able to join the war, I'm sure he was exposed to that just as much as anyone else he was told oh when you grow up join the uh, army I fight mean, for your country if you think of his age it was probably through all of his teenage years you know if, if he's yeah. if he's like 18 19 now it was probably during all of his formative years where he was being mm-hmm. bombarded with this idea of what it is to be a man and what it is to yeah. fight for your country and all that shit absolutely but then you have the people who actually went out there they did it and they came back broken and defeated and it wasn't something that was to be proud of it's the difference of the message you're told and the actual experience of it and these guys they know they can't convince this kid otherwise he's 100 percent bought into this so they just basically tell him like look we if you respect us as soldiers so much then you're gonna have to listen to us when we say no you can't go and they just leave him there and i think that it's this and specifically when uh, captain's walking away he tells doc is walking with him and he mutters under his breath saying we're leaving the future to you it's this idea of yeah this generation who went out to saw see war they went out and did all this stuff they're going to do it one more time maybe they'll live maybe they won't but they want the next generation to never have to know that to begin with they don't want them to have to go through that generational yeah. trauma that they did they're going off to finish the war they never felt they finished in the first place effectively mm-hmm um it's but again that the idea at the, the big speech where and it's the, i think it's the doc who says most of this where he says mm. look the, the government did not value human life right the country did not value human life we sent people out we literally had kamikaze pilots which their entire purpose and job was to commit suicide for a, a military advantage so we're not going to do that like yeah some of, not all of us might make it like this is dangerous no one's pretending that we're all going to be safe and everyone will come back but mm-hmm. the point going out here is not that giving your life is the way you can contribute, right? So yeah. we're going to try and live. That's the point. So, mm-hmm. like, that message is all great. And it's around this part of the movie where um, Shikishima has the idea. He comes to the dock and says, get me a plane. Mm-hmm. I can I can be the thing that lures Godzilla. Because they have to lure it to where they want to do this plan. I can be the one that lures it. Which... 
it's beautiful because it all goes back to that start he was meant to lure godzilla away from the mechanics and and his you know landed plane admittedly he wasn't flying around yeah. but that was the whole point he was meant to lure godzilla away and put himself in danger and he was offering up to do it so that actually feels like a good narrative arc even that immediately because yeah. like he's he's fulfilling the thing he was supposed to do in the first place um but the big thing coming out of that is that there's this idea like does he have like a like no, is he at such a low point now that he's kind of willing to die but not for the right reasons he's kind of willing yeah. to give himself up and that's where the captain's coming in and says you better not orphan that girl this, this is not a, say, a thing you, you know you say he's willing to die but not for the right reasons i think he sees all of this as the right reasons he oh, sees he every single one yeah, of he, these. No, yeah yeah he does but i think we objectively are, are you know looking well, at it, the whole picture right but that's why i think the movie makes the point of is there is no right reason like it, it, sure, oh, sure yeah for sure yeah 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 that the entire point of it is this idea of us building up to there is value in life as a whole there's no good reason to die even when it's godzilla himself you should still want to live yeah yeah i mean there's like i mean arguably noriko was an example of someone who kind of sacrificed herself to save mm. shikishima which in a, in a glorious way is kind of her her dying wish is saying you deserve to live right mm -hmm. so it's almost like he's not listening to what she was saying in death <laughs> by yeah, putting himself much. into this position but so the big thing here though is that he is like okay we've got this plane this experimental plane which is actually a really weird plane because the 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 back had the the, the, the spin the the, the propeller. yeah apparently it was real I, I looked that up it's totally a real thing i, I believe it i just but it looked i'm so used to how a plane like this from this era looks that this just felt wrong but yeah this idea that the uh the wings and the propeller were at the back of the plane so it looked mm -hmm. kind of funny when he's flying it around but he's adamant he wants a very specific mechanic he wants the mechanic from the island. He wants Tachibana. And yep. he's like, please, find him. He has to be the one. Because in his heart, he's making it up to him. Like, he's mm -hmm. the one who knows what my shame was. He's the one who witnessed me at my lowest point. He's the one who blames me. But more importantly, he's the one that he... The whole movie feels like he has to make it up to. And he can only have redemption yeah. if he sees that he's had redemption in his eyes, I think. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he, he basically is saying, like, yeah, I can go off and die, and that's great for my own personal thing, but, like, I need this guy that I failed before. I need him. Again, this idea that he was sacrificing his money and such towards Noriko, this is him saying, no, I'm sacrificing myself yeah. for you specifically, Tachibana. Like, I need you to know that. And one of the things that's so good is that during all this, put this all these speeches about um, not having to sacrifice yourselves, the, the subject of ejector seats... Uh, mm -hmm. comes up right it's, it's mentioned very briefly right and yep. there's a whole thing here where he he like writes out to a bunch of places where tachibana might be and it does lead tachibana to him I, he specifically writes out messages saying hey tachibana what happened on that island was your fault i take no <laughs> responsibility for it yeah well we don't know that when he's writing them though it's not until tachibana shows up and starts beating the shit out of him yeah. where he's like yeah, yeah i just told you that because i knew it would piss you off so you would definitely come and find me and i'm like yeah. you know what it's smart it worked i can't deny yeah. that it worked but what's so beautiful about this is that he agrees to fix up the plane and some time passes and you know they're getting ready blah blah, blah. And there's a whole thing right before the third act kicks off where he's like, okay, it's ready. We expect Godzilla's going to be back and land in like 10 hours or whatever. Mm -hmm. Here's the here's the plane. And he's showing him where the controls are. And he's like, okay, this is where you, you pull this out before you get the guns ready and blah, blah, blah. He's showing him where things are. Mm -hmm. And it does this thing. And he's like, oh, one more thing. And the camera cuts back to a wide shot and you don't hear what he's saying next. And like, in my heart, well, and, hold on, before you can say anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, yeah. in my heart, I was like, okay, there is nothing more perfect than this being the person who's saying you don't have to kill yourself. For it to be the mm -hmm. mechanic, for it to be uh, Tachibana, to be the one who says, pull this before you... Because at this point in the movie, uh, Shikishima has basically kind of admitted to to him specifically. He's, he's the only one he's told his real plan to is Tachibana. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to fly that plane into that bastard's mouth because that's where he's vulnerable and I'm going to set off all my missiles and bombs and whatever inside godzilla's mouth and that will cool. hopefully kill him 
So yeah, that's the re- that's what I think the reason that he wanted Tachibana to begin with is because if he asked anybody else who was like involved in the plan, oh, sure, yeah, all of yeah. them, all of them hearing this stuff about like, oh, we're all going to live and whatnot. Meanwhile, he specifically told Tachibana like, take out half the fuel, take out anything else you can, and just replace them with explosives. Yes, just like every part of this plane should just be a walking bomb. Absolutely, and I but it just it made so much narrative sense to me. Nothing could be more beautiful than him being the one mm-hmm. to say to him, "You don't have to die. Yeah. You can leave." And because there's that, but, there's that sequence as well, like right in, right before that happens, right before it cuts that wide shot, where he pulls out that folder of the images of all of like the family members of um, yeah, yeah, yeah. the people that he allowed to die, and Tachibana sees that, and then to add that little extra special touch, he has his own picture that was drawn by his at this point essentially adopted daughter of him and his now deceased essentially wife and tachibana sees that and that's where you get this idea of like he's been tachibana sees like yes i put that on you so you would have to live with those ghosts but like i didn't realize that you would still manage to get your own life out of it and it now feels wrong for you to be robbed of that yeah i think it's this idea that time even for how he felt about shikishima has changed like seeing that mm-hmm. he has a life seeing that he has someone that cares about him just like these men had someone that cared about them mm-hmm. uh like that that humanized them and I, I think it just made so much much perfect narrative sense that even though it cuts to that wide shot and you don't get to hear what he says in this moment and like he is definitely telling him that he doesn't have to die he's telling him about yeah. the ejector seat and that we're going to have that payoff later on when it looks like he's going to you know commit suicide he's going to use the ejector seat and later on when it does do that moment it does it cuts back to this and you get to hear him say it it is beautiful that the character who gave him basically forgiveness and said you don't have to die you don't have to do it this way you can still achieve what you're you're setting out to do just pull this this lever and that's it yep that's all you need to do he could have not told him that but he went out of his way to do it and it's it's beautiful to to pay it off like that and that Mm -hmm. of course leads us in to the glorious third act which is yes. this can-do attitude of nothing but civilians who have you know blo- you know basically talked the the government or the military or whoever whatever bodies is currently existing to give them four battleships to like, enact this plan so they're out i think they said they got those from the united nations oh, that they yeah, were fair enough, yeah. originally slaved to go there and they're like uh could we have those like temporarily for the giant monster that attacked tokyo like, and, a few weeks ago and the un's like uh yeah you know what yeah that's fair uh, yeah all right yeah. here you go have some ships but it is important to note that because they were un ships they don't actually have any like firepower of their own there is no like guns on no, these ships. no. Uh, it's all just cables because that's what they're doing mm-hmm. they're, they're going to lure godzilla into this part of the water and they're going to have two of the small boats, like, you know, sail around them and circle mm-hmm. them with these things. And that's what happens. You know, Godzilla is on an island or whatever, and that's where... Yeah, he... They they have all these, like, early warning systems, and they, they're like, okay, we're going to know if Godzilla hits us, and we'll be able to launch out with plenty of time. And then Godzilla just zooms right through that and hits the mainland before he, they even get a chance to get on the boats. And she's like, all right, well... Get on the boats anyway, and we'll have Shikishima just lure him back out to sea. That's the best we can hope for. Yeah, so Shikishima, you know, shoots him in the face a bunch. And that's, these shots, there's a great wide shot, actually, of him flying around Godzilla's head. And Godzilla mm-hmm. obviously keeps, like, trying to bite him or swipe at him, and Missy's just narrow. So this is all very fantastically done stuff, even on its own. Oh, yeah. But then, you know, he lures him out into the water, and it's during all this stuff where when Godzilla's sort of, like, near or whatever, where the theme kicks in... And you mm-hmm. get the montage and the, the more upbeat, mm. hopeful part of it starts playing as all the civilians are like getting the cables ready. And it's like, oh, they feel hopeful here. They feel like they have a chance where they might win. They might save the day. And you feel great. And th- th- this this the third act has so many peaks and valleys in a good way of it being oh, yeah. hope. And then, oh no, absolute despair because this didn't work. Oh no, it's not going to work properly. And then it's like, oh no, better hope because Zilla's actually sinking. He goes down. And mm-hmm. they've got like a, a meter that's like recording and measuring how far he is. Like, oh, 800 feet, 900 feet, 1,000. It gets all the way to like 1,500 feet. It's like, oh, okay, that's it. Time to get the inflatables going. And that starts bringing him back up again. But then it gets to a point where, oh, no, it stopped at around 700 feet. That's weird. Yeah. Uh, he gets about mm-hmm. halfway up and then they reveal that Godzilla managed to chew through the inflatables. So yes. they come up without him. But he's managed to keep himself at a low enough depth that he's not 
dead. He still is injured, but he's not immediately going to die yeah. from decompression. When he does come up, he's kind of like, it looks like he's got like a layer of ice on him, like he's been like freezing down there because he was so mm. low down. Um, and one of the big moments here where the, the music drops out, this is the big kind of climax well, of it. Hold on. Oh. B- before that, though, um, there is a sequence where as they're trying to pull him up, Godzilla's weight is just too much for these two destroyers to handle. So the kid and a whole bunch of other civilian tugboats all come in to help provide that extra pulling force to get Godzilla back up to the surface. That, that's right, yeah. I forgot that was first, you're right, yeah. yeah. So so the kid has like a big grand entrance where he gets to be helpful and it's all these little civilian boats. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's basically a much better version of that scene in Dunkirk where all the civilian boats show up to rescue everyone. Yep. It's that, but it's better because Godzilla's cooler than Dunkirk. <laughs> Man, I would love Dunkirk to just throw in a random Godzilla halfway through. That'd be fantastic. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, so so yeah, the, the boats pull up Godzilla, but the the music goes out and the, all the sounds go out even because Godzilla's getting ready for his breath. I mean, we didn't mention this earlier, mm-hmm. but when he's getting ready for his breath, it actually mm-hmm. does that thing that the 2014 like American Godzilla does, where the lights it lights up at the tip of the tail and starts going up his back. This mm-hmm. also adds in the extra element where all the uh, the fins start sticking out. They all sort of like protrude a bit. Yeah, like each one pops out yeah. just like as a... It feels more like a nuclear reactor. It does. Like that seems like kind of like the control rods the rod's popping going out up. one yeah, by one. Yeah. So the rods are going out one by one, going up his back. And he did that earlier, of course, when he, he nuked the city. Here at the end of the movie, he's getting ready and he's looking right at the ship. And it's the ship that's got the dock on it, that's got the captain on it, all the characters that we know that we care about. Mm-hmm. And... At this point, this is when I'm like, damn, I care so much about these characters that the movie's got me. The movie yeah. has done such a good job of making me give a shit. I, I'm not just here for Godzilla doing cool monster shit. I'm here because I actually care about the outcome to these character stories. And the mouth's like opening way that's lighting up and then the sound just goes out because they think they're all going to die. They th- you know, mm-hmm. It's almost actually, again, compared to Oppenheimer when the, the, the sound goes out, when the the nuke goes off when for the, the first time up, yeah yeah mm-hmm. it's kind of similar to that where it's like they all think they're going to die so the sounds just dripped away mm-hmm. and it lasts a good 20 30 seconds of just silence as they're yeah, just they all cut, watching they cut between pretty much every character that we would have any emotional attachment to and you just see their faces drop and how they're like all just immediately coming to peace with like well we did our best but now it's the end yeah uh and then you just hear the plane engine just slowly come in and it's it's Shikishima just flying in, and them mm-hmm. all looking up Kenneth and Hope. He gets the hero's entrance, and he's flying up. And but I, what I love about it so much though is the captain's reaction is different to everyone else. The captain is looking up and going, "No, don't kill yourself." Like that's his demeanor during yeah. this scene. He's yelling for Shikishima not to die, um, which just adds this extra layer of. And the music here is so good because at this point it's like this really sort of prolonged like high notes on the strings mm-hmm. that's just making everything feel very sort of emotional and epic uh but yeah he flies into godzilla's mouth and then the, the, the godzilla's head blows up to the point where uh afterwards the body just starts to sort of crumble and fall apart it's, yeah. it's really quite a spectacular it, visual it seems like you know his head exploding that was enough to kill him more or less maybe he would have been able to regenerate but it was because he was specifically in the middle of an atomic breath and building that up that like all of that atomic energy just started tearing his body apart one to one so i honestly i think that all three things needed to happen in order to kill godzilla here of the atomic breath needed to be built up they had to go through that whole decompression recompression thing and the bombs had to blow up his head i think if any part of that was missing he would have been able to survive I think that's and arguably the ending implies that you still can't kind of survive. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a great big moment. And, you know, like, it's a real crowd pleaser when you see the parachute and they're all kind of mm. relieved. And when he gets back, of course, one of the things we didn't mention is that it was a quick moment because he left the girl with the neighbor, right? Mm-hmm. And even left a note and some money afterwards to, to imply, hey, I'm not coming back. Like, use this money to look after her. She gets a telegram. The neighbor gets a telegram during all this. And we don't know what it says. We just see her reaction. And at right. the end of the movie, he's back on the, the docks when the ship comes in and she runs up and is kind of like obviously happy that everything's okay, but kind of hits him and says, you're an idiot and hands him the telegram, which makes him run. And you have this sort of moment of realization what this probably is because he's, yeah. running, he's running in a hospital and you're like, oh shit. 
this is going to reveal that Noriko didn't die, that she's actually been found, she's alive. Maybe she was like lying in a hospital unidentified for, you know, however long she was asleep. Yeah, I mean, that was the whole thing is that the um they didn't allow people into the city because it was so radioactive. Yeah, so yeah. she may have just been out for a while and then eventually some crew found her. So we go in, she's got bandages on and whatnot. And it's, yeah, like it, this is very cheesy at this moment, but I think it's earned it at this point where I'm so happy that he gets. This is almost like he gets like a, like the, the fate has stepped in and rewarded him for making the right choice, for choosing not to commit suicide. He's been yep. rewarded cosmically because now he can have his family, he can have a wife and a child, and yeah, we get this payoff. There's that, there's that recurring theme though that I feel really applies in this moment. In he keeps on. Every time he goes through one of his, like, PTSD flashbacks sort of thing, he essentially says, maybe I did die on that island. Maybe I died with the rest of them, and this is just some dying dream I have. Everything that's happened mm -hmm. after that point is just some dream I have. I think that it really hits hard that, yes, theoretically, he could have died in that attack on Godzilla. He could have flown in there, and there wouldn't have been an ejection seat. But everything immediately following that point does kind of have this like dreamlike quality to it it's this idea of like oh yeah he hit the ejection seat and then the woman he loved managed to actually survive this horrible thing and it's it's i don't know it's kind of got that idea it's kind of like the end of inception where it's this idea of like does it even matter anymore whether or not this is real or is he just happy that he's managed to find his own inner peace you know yeah i mean i think it is real i think the idea is that it plays into what you're saying here, where he's been saying that about everything that's happened. It's just, just some nightmare, and I actually did mm -hmm. just die on that island. I think the idea that this does feel almost dreamlike is just playing into this idea that he... It's not a nightmare anymore. Like, the happiness is going to... If, mm -hmm. if everything before made him question if it's a nightmare, then now this happiness, he can question, am I just living a happy dream now, kind of thing. Yeah. And, you know, she says, is your war over yet? And he just sort of breaks down, you know, by her side, and is this happy ending? Yeah. yeah. And obviously, there's the one little thing here that I actually don't know what you think about, which is the neck. Oh my god, yes. I have been <laughs> racking my brain trying to figure out what the hell this means. So, yeah, her neck uh, has, like, it's, it's like her vein is, like, sticking out, but it's, like, sort of, like, this black fluid going through her yeah, vein. Yeah, it's like a black mark on just, like, the back side of her neck yeah. where it was, like, jugular would be. And it's, it's an interesting little detail to add on here because i don't think this is trying to like sell for a sequel i don't think they're maybe maybe they will make a sequel i don't know but uh... yeah i okay so obviously there's the very final shot real quick just to wrap it up yeah which there's, is there's, there's a meaty chunk of godzilla that starts to mutate as if it's as if he's regrowing from the central part of his body mm -hmm. as if he's going yep. to grow back to full size again yep so all right i've got two theories and i will admit that i sourced one of these theories from the internet okay um so essentially the idea is kind of sequel bait where it there was a kind of throwaway line when they were saying oh this you know attack on the city or whatnot um there are like scales of godzilla or like specimens of godzilla around and the idea was that during the attack she essentially got infected with one of them and has the same sort of regenerative ability now that godzilla has and that's why she was able to even survive that nuclear blast to begin with. Okay. I'm not partial to that one just because it feels like it kind of takes away from the central like themes that the story is saying if, for something if, completely separate. Yeah, that feels like sort of like someone's just sort of found a way in plot to make it make sense rather than it working emotionally, I guess. Right. So then my secondary idea, and this goes back to the idea that I've seen Chernobyl, and that's essentially that Yes, yeah, she's fine right now, but she does have some like underlying radiation poisoning sort of thing. So while she is back, she is alive, it is still kind of a bittersweet ending of she's not got like that long left. I don't like that either. I think that's even worse. That's the same. But like, well, that's the thing. Well, I When I say I've been racking my brain, I have no idea I, what I, this means. I See, I don't think... I think both of those just kind of take away from the emotion of the scene. I think, mm -hmm. to me, if you look at it more from a, like, a, what does it represent rather than like a literal, like, you know, condition she has or whatever. Yeah. I think it's maybe more just... And, and that's maybe ties in as well with the final shot of like, Godzilla's going to regrow, is that 
if, if you are saying this represented his shame and his PTSD, that's not something that you just, like, okay, I'm over it now, it's wrapped up in a bow. Like, the idea of your mental health, you know, you don't just solve it and it's done for life. Like, yeah. it's always going to be there in some form or another. You just manage it in some in some form. And um, I think the idea that Godzilla is going to regrow and he can regrow kind of represents mm-hmm. that. The, the you know, the, the thing in our neck, this little ominous thing that they kind of just throw in right at the very end, I don't know if that's maybe just saying something like, yeah, like, okay, he's having this happy dreamlike ending, but this is to show that it won't, you know, it won't entirely like it's be not, perfect. it's not unblemished. Yeah. It, it's, there is still that negative to she, it. She's going to have our trauma from this, just like you have your trauma, and you, but hopefully you can fight it together. You you found this life together and had this mm-hmm. happiness to, to an extent that you were allowed, to, that you were willing to allow it at least in this post-war where, where you were both at your, your worst and you had this kid to look after. You know, I, you'll survive again, you'll rebuild again kind of thing. Maybe throwing out a different idea that now that Noriko has also gone through a Godzilla attack, maybe it's representative. Now she has her own PTSD. She has her own, like, not shame, but just her own, like, thing that is going to affect her well, life actually, from that, now on. I'll spin that out. I'll say it's not that she's got her own thing, though. It's now that she shares his. They share it, because oh, now, yeah. now they're unified. Now they're, now they're a pair, now they're going to share it, and they can share that burden together. And maybe that's why it's not necessarily a bad thing that you see that at the end. It's more like, no, no, they'll get through this together, because like if she can help get, get through his PTSD and Godzilla and war, you know, like she, part of that's now on her. Maybe that's all it says, yeah. is that part of that's now in her. It's not just on him anymore. Uh, and that's actually kind of a more hopeful oh, yeah, side to absolutely. it. Which I feel like the movie's going for more of that vibe at the end, which is why I, I don't like the, ah, she's going to die soon. <laughs> like, yeah. it's, it just the, feels, it feels disingenuous the, to what the movie's doing. If the movie ended with the shot of her neck, I would be wholesale just saying, yep, wholesome. It's whatever it represents. It's something good and nice because that's just the feeling it wants to leave with. But because it then cut to that shot of Godzilla regenerating out in the sea, I don't know. Like, it's it could go with, like, this is implying a thematic link of we showed the thing on her neck and cut to Godzilla. It From a filmmaking language, it seems like we should be linking those two in but, some way. And I think we just did. I think what we just said yeah. there about them now sharing that burden of, the, of Godzilla represents, like, everything negative in him really <laughs> um, mm-hmm. then she, she th- can now share that with him yeah and that's the thing that like i really do enjoy about this godzilla is that like you said it's symbolic the whole way through yes he is this creature and they go through like the bare necessities of yeah he was at the bikini atoll and he got hit with radiation blah 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 but like they gloss over that super quick because the primary focus is he is supposed to be this creature that represents so much more than just giant lizard monster. He is the shame of the individual. He is the PTSD of the people. He represents the nuclear bombs themselves. He has all of this going for him. And that's why when I say that he is godlike in this, it's not that he's godlike in that people revere him or whatever. It's that he represents so many different things to so many different people. Yeah. Um, and I think this is not as important, maybe, but I think the ending, that final shot, also just works in a meta sense of, like, you're here because you love Godzilla, and Godzilla is an idea for us, the audience, will never die. So that's why mm-hmm. we have this little moment at the end where, yeah, Godzilla's not really gone. Like, even if the next movie has nothing to do with this one, and it might probably even won't. It'll probably be another standalone film. This, I mean, you know... I Personally, what I'd love to see, and this is entirely what Toho decides to do, I'd love to see it being a continuation again but still a period piece but this time it's in the 80s it's right around that second era uh, of godzilla sure and we just move our way through the eras until we get caught up to like modern day that could be interesting maybe the the little girl grown up could be the the main character even the yeah daughter. maybe yeah yeah she would be kind I of mean, a good age for it if only they were twins we could have brought in mothra <laughs> very good um no i think that's that's interesting, especially if they do decide to bring another monster. I don't know what they would do with the, in this this movie's context. Yeah. Actually, see, that's the, I was going to say something that you said there made me remember one of the most surreal moments for me at the, right at the start of this movie it was just seeing the Toho logo on a big screen because I'd never seen mm-hmm. it in a cinema before. So it was it was yeah. kind of special to see that on its own. I'm I am kind of happy that 
I mean, obviously it's dependent on like licensing and stuff like that, but I am kind of happy that this movie didn't do that thing Shin Godzilla did where it just like captioned everything that was Japanese on screen and explained what it was. Oh yeah, we didn't need that. We did not need that. Yeah, this, w- this was a lot better just being subtitles only. Yeah, yeah obviously all of the captions saying, you know, final days of the war, this is now mm-hmm. 1945, whatever, or 1946. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think it's 1947 by the time the movie ends, but... It's, yeah, it's May 1947 yeah, when at the, the end. When the third act takes place, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, this was phenomenal. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think it has the symbolism you want from the best kind of Godzilla movie. It has the more intricate character arc and story. You know, it's this beautiful character story of someone who's ashamed of not being able to give his life, but then the ultimate arc is about him wanting to live. Uh, at the mm-hmm. end, which makes it super uplifting, and that that's beautiful throughout. But then you also get the great monster movie stuff. You get scenes that are reminiscent of stuff from Jaws. You get all these different elements that are kind of sprinkled throughout. I'll tell you this: the director's now on my radar because I thought this was exceptionally oh, yeah. well done. No doubt. I I especially like how when it comes down to the human plot, that's one thing in like the original like Godzilla twenty fourteen. Uh, with that human plot. I felt like they were pushing so hard to make it relatable, to make it just this everyman where it's, you know, oh, yeah, he he has this loving family and he has all this stuff that he wants to get back to. He has a child at home that he needs to get back mm-hmm. to and he loves him uh, loves him unconditionally. But, like, this movie, it's about PTSD and post-war and stuff like that. And, like, he even, like, tells the child, like, no, I'm not your dad. I don't want that. It's not a character that's easily related to just by happenstance and circumstance. But over the course of the movie, it does a fantastic job of getting you to understand where this character is coming from, to understand that shame and guilt on a much larger scale than anything that the 2014 Godzilla did. Yeah, and just the, the, just re- the way he's putting up walls with the daughter, especially the way he's refusing mm-hmm. to accept that he's the father, the way he corrects her. Um, every time he interacts with her, you can just feel the entire audience kind of like feeling something th- for her yeah. because he's not letting her have that connection. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, all that was super just, effective. Just to wrap up the 2014 comparisons, though, apparently trivia here is Gareth Edwards, who, of course, directed that movie, uh, saw the film, obviously, and he described him feeling a sense of jealousy while watching it because, quote, this is what a Godzilla movie should be like. Yeah, I still really like the 2014 movie, so I... Oh, yeah, same. I I wouldn't uh, shit on it at all. I think some of the visuals in that movie are phenomenal, especially in the third mm-hmm. act. I, uh, But yeah, there's, there's no comparison as far as the character story goes. Like the human characters mm-hmm. in this are easily the best human characters that have ever been in a Godzilla movie, and I don't even think it's a competition. Um, I think this, this is the first Godzilla movie I felt in a while that didn't feel like the first priority of it was selling a toy of Godzilla. Like, that always felt like it had a primary focus of, like, okay, but you want to get this, like, the Shin Godzilla that's three feet tall. You want that, right? It's like, no, this one is just, he's there, but he is so much more than just an action figure. Yeah, I, like, honestly, by the time I got to the end of this movie, there was such an emotional roller coaster of being so invested in everything that was going on. And part of that is because of the symbolism, but part of it's also just because it's good characters, because they... Mm-hmm. They have something to care about, and you, you, you build up this relationship with Noriko over the course of the first half of the movie, and then you take it away, and then you've got this unrequited thing where he wants to make up for that, and that's going to drive him to a decision. And yeah, part of me thinks like, would it have been powerful if he'd made the choice to live and she still was dead? Like, you know, it's like he get obviously mm-hmm. he gets to be a father, he gets to fulfill that part of his life. Um, I wasn't mad though that they brought her back because I was like, you know what? I feel like he's earned it in a weird way. I feel like he's earned the yeah. happy ending, and that was uh, it worked really well in that regard. So, um, yeah, I I think we're going to rate this very highly. I think it, like I'll just say, I, it probably is the second best Godzilla movie after the original nineteen fifty four one, and. I think it gets there without too much of a fight. Like I, I, you know, I, I thought Shin was great. I really like Godzilla eighty four. I love mm-hmm. Ghidorah the three headed monster. Even Invasion of the Astro Monster right after that's good fun. Uh, there's a couple mm-hmm. from the nineties that I know I really like, but they've all kind of blurred together now because it's been a while since I've seen them. 
Uh, it's... Absolutely adore 1998, obviously. So. <laughs> you shut your mouth. You shut your goddamn mouth. But I think this slots in to right under uh, the original. And, you know, I really like Godzilla 2014, but I think this is definitely better than it um, in a number of ways. There's still, what, what I love about that movie, I still love about it. And I, I still probably, it, it's probably still in my top five overall of Godzilla movies. But mm-hmm. I think this easily goes to number two after the original. So with that said, though, what are you rating Godzilla minus one? Oh, God. Um, I mean, it, it's it's such a battle here. Honestly, my, my bouncing between is 9.5 and 10. Like, it's great. It's a fantastic movie. I just, I'm trying to, in my head, reason out, like, Am I just still riding the high of seeing Godzilla in the theater, getting that, like, real emotional push from it because it was just all-encompassing? Does it really deserve the 10? I'm gonna say that I did really love it, but I am still gonna give it the (laughs) 9.5. I think that it's so close. It's so close there. There are just a few things in there that I, as much as I loved it, like, when Tara was saying how sometimes it did look a little bit video gamey, I can see that. I can see sometimes those, the Godzilla yeah, those, effects those, aren't like, yeah. Uh, you know, the effects have their perfect moments and they have their less than perfect moments. And mm-hmm. I think that's very safe. Yeah. Um, and I, but like overall, it's the fact that I am considering giving it the flat 10 says all that you need to know. So, yeah. I mean, I wasn't like, I, you know, it takes a lot to get, get a 10 out of me. Like I, I've only, I think if you look at my letterbox, then you look at my my ten out of tens. I've only got maybe like twenty of them, and you know I've yeah, seen fair. I've seen thousands of movies. Like it, like it takes a lot for me to like make that push. And I think very rarely anything that I've given a ten to, I've done it after one viewing. It's sort of like it earns yeah. it over time, kind of thing. Usually, that's, not always, but usually. That's one of those things where like I have to remember that i i'm only watching this the one time the per- real tens are the ones that earn it over multiple viewings yeah um i think for me i th- i think it comfortably shot into a straight nine out of ten and that I, that does say a lot for me i i don't think many movies you know i i don't even necessarily have a nine every year never mind a mm-hmm. ten so for for me this 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 shot up to that nine out of ten level i loved it I think it has a great character story. I think it looks fantastic, and the music's great. I listened to some yeah. of the score when, when I got home uh, after seeing it. I wanted to, to hear some of that music again. I should do that. I was really into the music as it was playing. Yeah, and it just... Good characters, good monster stuff. The monster stuff had weight because of what it represented. Honestly, mm. like there's very little here I would, I would mark it down for. And even if you do think one or two moments are a little bit in the melodramatic side... I think it works in the context of the movie and I was super into it as it was happening. So mm-hmm. for me, this is exceptional and I'm very glad that when we get Godzilla cross Kong in a few months, I'm very mm-hmm. glad that it's going for, obviously it's not going to be as good, but I'm glad that it's not trying to be this and not succeeding. I'm glad that it's, oh, yeah. it's trying to be a silly thing where Godzilla and Kong have weapons and they're fighting some monsters. Give me this, like I, there's room in my life for silly Godzilla and there's room in my life for this Godzilla and I'm happy that we get both at the same time. It's actually kind of wonderful that we do. So, yeah, yeah. I'm down with it. That, see, that's the sort of thing, like, when it came down to the DCEU. Like, if we were going to keep that going for a while, I, I'm fine with silly stories with Flash and Ben Affleck, Batman and all that. But then it, we need to have the Robert Pattinson one showing up every once in a while. I'm cool with that. And I think that this is a good way to handle this, where America can have its crazy-ass monsterverse where we're going up against every kaiju that's ever been imagined. And then we have the serious symbolic story from Toho. And I like that too. Yeah. So there you go. That's Godzilla minus one. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Highly recommended. Uh, love that I got to see it in the theater. So uh, yeah, just before David tells us about his homework movie, I'll mm. just uh, take this moment to plug uh, patreon.com slash TV. You can support the show and keep it coming as well as all the other podcasts and stuff that we do at Mailfuzz Movies and Mailfuzz TV. Uh, you can go over there and you get access to some bonus shows. Monthly, me and David do two bonus shows. We have the Criterion Cup, where we review movies from the Criterion Collection. Pretty self-explanatory. And then yep. at the $5 and up tier, we have 
the Extra Real show where we review some of the worst things of all time. And hey, coming up later in December, David Dakota's A Talking Cat is on the menu. So that's mm-hmm. a, an example of that. Uh, Neil Breen gets reviewed on there. Uh, things of that nature. So if you want mm-hmm. to see us lose our minds in hilarity, bewilderment, and just awe of how bad something can be, Extra Reels is the show for you. Uh, yep. So you can check out that plus other bonus stuff uh, by supporting us over at patreon.com slash TV. so do, do have a look uh, you can support us for free by simply liking helps us out a lot if you do that on YouTube or rating the podcast five stars wherever you get your podcast from uh, all these things do help out a bunch so please do but yes David has a homework movie and I don't know if he's stuck no he probably wouldn't have done because Shin Godzilla's not going out for a while so I have no yeah. idea what movie you're doing for this week's homework but the homework, of course, is David going back and watching a sci-fi movie that me and Tara did before he joined the show, so that over time he's seen all those movies too and has the the full uh, knowledge of, of the show, if you will. So what, what, did, what did you watch, David? Well, like you were saying, um, my original plan back when Minus One was going to be well after Shin Godzilla is that I was going to be doing a Godzilla movie from MonsterVerse with this, not only to get prepared for... Uh, Godzilla X Kong, but also, you know, just because it makes sense. It's something that makes sense. But since Shin Godzilla has A, already been filmed, and I, spoiler alert, started the MonsterVerse with that one, I can't really do the second one now. Yes. So I've decided to go with something that is instead focusing on the fact that I should be watching 80s movies for a future countdown we've got planned. So I thought, well... What's a movie about a group of people who have to deal with this rampaging monster that's going through their town, destroying everything in sight? It's The Blob Ah! from 1988. David, hockey season Hmm. ended months ago. You know, it's great. I I literally (laughs) watched your review of it, and that's how you ended that review as well. So, (laughs) bravo. Oh, um, so I love the just blob con- so much. <laughs> yeah, just for context, I never actually watched the 1950s blob before this, so this is my only Man. exposure to the blob. You should, you should still watch it, but it, like, I, that, it doesn't matter which water do you see mm-hmm. them in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, actually, I was, I was pleasantly surprised. I think that uh, going into this movie, I see, you know, the poster for it. I get a very Cronenberg feel from it. I get this idea of, you know, a lot of body horror and stuff going on. And that's true for a good amount of the movie. But I also didn't expect it to have as much of a solid character building as it did. I expected it to just be like a random group of people. And then like the blob gets the primary focus. But no, they did a pretty good job of um, the primary two characters getting a good solid grip on that. In addition to it, I was very surprised that they went by the motive of anyone can die because Uh, there were plenty of characters that they introduced that I said, well, they have to be safe. And then they just immediately show up dead. So bravo to that. Um, Special effects. Yeah. The practical effects though. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a character who you're sure is like the main character and Mm -hmm. uh, eh, maybe not so much. (laughs) Nah. There's also another character who gets like a whole bunch of plot and you expect him to be around the whole time. Nope, halfway through, he's gone. <laughs> so, yeah, no, overall, it just shocked me. But yeah, the practical effects, um, fantastic. I, I, There was one comment that you made halfway through that you never want there to be a remake of The Blob because it would all be CGI yeah, rather than that's... any sort of practical. I agree wholesale. <laughs> I I think that the beauty of this movie, even though there are some points where the special effects falls down, the beauty of this movie is in the fact that there is a pile of pink goo that somebody has maneuvered in a way, and it just makes it work that much better. So overall, enjoyable movie. Um, I actually really like the soundtrack, too, because it has like more of a rock theme than I was expecting. I was expecting like spooky, scary music the whole time, but it had mm. some pretty good rock themes in there. So yeah, overall, I'd say this one, eh, this one manages to squeak out like an eight for me. Oh, yeah. I was very pleasantly surprised when we did because i'd never seen it when we did it for the show so it was uh mm. it was a pleasant surprise i was like this movie's kind of awesome like what what, yeah. what the hell so yeah oh very good uh, that's a solid i'm pick. actually i'm actually really surprised that um oh what was her name shawnee smith uh she kind of got like final girl status in this movie and i'm surprised she never became like a bigger 
action-y sort of star based off of how she acted in this. She did very good. Do you know what's so funny about that is that I knew her from like Becker, the, the Ted Danson TV show mm -hmm. and like the end of the 90s, start of the 2000s. And I remember seeing this and really been like, wait, was she that old that she was playing a teenager already in 1988? I thought she was younger than that, but okay. Right. Uh, I, I guess she's just got that kind of youthful... I mean, she looks older now, but like, because she's in like the oh, first yeah. couple of Saw movies... Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. When I saw her in Saw, I thought she was in, like, maybe mid-20s. Yeah. Or, like, but late not. 20s at latest. Yeah, no, no. She, she, she must have been pushing 40 by the time she was in yeah. Saw, based on this movie. So She was born in 69, so she would have been 19 in The Blob. Which would have made her 35 in Saw 1. Okay, yeah, that yep. makes sense. All right, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yep. Uh, but there you go. That's, uh, that's The Blob. It's a, it's a great movie uh also a monster movie no, it's obviously very different than godzilla but it's it's it's, yep. it's them running it's like, from a monster I'm, I'm doing my best to keep the theming tight here it, it, but it's really hard it doesn't matter it really doesn't yeah. it's just <laughs> the important part is that you're you're checking through the movies and you're discovering some mm -hmm. good stuff and that's the yep. that's the important thing so uh, that is the show that is the atomic cinema experiment hopefully you enjoyed our discussion of godzilla minus one and the little bonus section on the blob and uh, we'll see you next time for another new release, unfortunately. Hmm. Because Zack Ugh. Snyder's got a new movie out, and he had to make a sci-fi movie, so now we have to talk about it, and I'm not happy about it. I'm also not happy that he just, like, a month before it came out, said, oh, by the way, it's so long, it's two parts now, because now we've got a second one to do in, like, April, the bastard. I'm fully expecting them to pull a Fast and Furious, though, and it's just going to keep on getting an extra part every single time the next part's about to come out. We're going to be on, like, part seven, and he's going to be like, part nine, everybody! It's coming! And it's already been reviewed on Rotten Tomatoes. It ain't looking so hot. I'll just Ugh. say that. Nope. Uh, I mean, just, just to set up for Rebel Moon here, which is what we're talking about. Rebel mm. Moon... It's not even legend. We just know this. It was a failed pitch for a Star Wars... Zack Snyder pitched a Star Wars story to Disney. It got rejected. So he crossed out some names and made Rebel Moon. And that's what we're, we're getting. We're getting his Star Wars movie. I really hope that the original script is out there somewhere. Just so with the person that I see and I say, that's Han Solo. That's Luke Skywalker. I can like confirm that oh, and be I mean, like oh yep that's him i don't know if he was actually using those characters but you expect Zack snyder to have any sort of creativity and originality in his works pete i'm just saying i don't think he would have been using those names in his script even if he was technically doing those types of characters all right uh, I, I suspect when he changed it for netflix all he did was uh, search find and replace oh uh jetsu finbar has now called Actually, we wouldn't even have to change that because that wouldn't even be a character. Yeah, he, I was going to say he would just have to change probably some planet names and maybe like it's not yeah. the Empire, it's the the kingdom. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's pick another word. I don't know. <laughs> it's not the Empire. It's the fortress. It's not a lightsaber. It's a laser saber. It's a spark sword. <laughs> so yeah that's next week uh mm -hmm. and we have to record that like right before christmas so we, we're yeah. uh we're not thrilled the greatest about it. gift <laughs> we're not thrilled about it so thank you very much for joining us we appreciate it keep watching science fiction and computer add salsa <laughs> <laughs>